Lord, we're thankful that we can have Greek class. Please help the recording and all that stuff to work. Bless the physical students in the class, uh, the students that could watch this over distance. We commit all of this to you. Bless our teaching time, and we pray that you'd help uh, the students to learn your glorious holy word and, and the language in which you gave it. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Da 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 and you Hos anthropos et apenosen Hauton genomenas upecus Me crithanatu Thanatu destauru Me crithanatu Thanatu Room. Dia kai hafe ha sautan Hu per upsose Kai e karesa tautanama Tahu per pananama Hina and Toana Mati Supan Ganu Kamse Epurane on Kai Epigayon Kai Katak Sagosa Examala Gesetai Hati Kurias Jesus Christos Es Doxante Upa Atras Amen. You may be seated. Amazing truth and if you don't know what all those words mean yet, that would be understandable, but uh, you look at an interlinear, so you actually know what you're singing, and it's really amazing. I mean, the, the, this truth here is just absolutely incredible, and so praise God for that, and I'm thankful that we can uh, sing the infallible word of God in this way. All right, uh, so you can go to chapter 11 in your textbook here. All right. Oops. Make this go away. Oh, I know why it's too big. It's because it's, okay. When it goes up on the screen, it kind of shrinks. All right, so we've got our exegetical insight here. And he's talking let me get this. Okay, physical book. Physical books are still better than ebooks if you're going to read the whole thing, in my opinion. So, but ebooks are very useful. So he talks about here Luke four six. As sometimes small words carry big punch. Uh, so gives an example in Luke four six when the Lord Jesus is getting tempted. So I'll put Luke four six up here. So the devil said to him, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, to whomsoever will I give it. And here we have the Greek here, kai apen, and he said to him, kai apen auto, ha diabolos, the devil, soy, 
to thee, doso, I will give, te nexusion, uh, this authority or power, uh, taute, this, this authority or power, uh, ha pasan, all, kaitain, doxon, auton, and the glory of them. And he says, it is delivered to me. He doesn't say who delivered it to him, because that would kind of, you know, <laughs> that would be God, and, you know, that would, yeah, we'll leave that part out, okay? And so, but, but he does that, all right? And so uh, Bach says that the soy, to thee, is emphatic. And so the devil is offering authority over the earth <coughs> if the Lord Jesus will uh, worship the devil. So this offer is just for you. And I think it's true that the exegetical insight here is emphatic, and it does illustrate a nuance in the original language text that is not that easy to convey in English. Not that there's anything wrong with English, but uh, you do see that uh, emphatic character here. So we thank God for that. Um, do, you, do anybody know who Daryl Bach is? Son of Mr. and Mrs. Bach. Chicken's favorite theologian. Uh, but he's an evangelical. He's a former president of the Evangelical Theological Society. And um, this exegetical insight is fine, but just so you're aware, um, I, I wrote a paper called Evangelical Modernism where they talk about the... Uh, synoptic gospels and they do different things. So for example, uh, he says that, that Bach says uh, that the parables of Mark 13 and Mark 4, where it says at the beginning of Mark 13 that the same day <clears throat> Jesus went out of the house, sat by the seaside, and he spake many things to them in parables. And then it says when he finished these parables, he departed then. So that's what Mark 13 says at the beginning and the end. So it says he spoke them all right at that day in one time. But Bach says that they... Uh, were compilations. They weren't a historical discourse given in one day by Jesus. They were compilations where Matthew put all these parables together, which is also something that uh, Robert Stein, um, Blomberg, Brooks, other evangelicals say. So the Lord Jesus, the, the infallible word of God, says that it's an actual discourse given on one day. They say it's not. Uh, Bach, when he's president of the ETS, the Evangelical Theological Society, he opposed kicking out those who hold to the heresy of open theism so it would be fun. you can deny that God comprehensively knows the future, and he thinks, that's fine, you can be evangelical, we'll leave you in here. I mean, you, God doesn't perfectly know the future. Yeah, you know, it's not that right, not that big of a problem. Uh, he th thinks that the Gospels aren't Christ's actual words, his ipsissima verba, just his vox, his voice. So this particular exegetical insight is fine, but Bach is, is heretical. And unfortunately, uh, many evangelicals today hold to extremely serious errors on things like these things. And I think part of it is, you know, not giving the gospel carefully. Part of it is the uh, the false Jesus presented in false worship in many of their uh, religious organizations, and as a result, many of them don't get saved. And so you have a large percentage of unregenerate evangelicals, and so then they can adopt all these heresies. So, um, so that's unfortunate. This particular exegetical insight is fine, but just be aware that uh, the fact that somebody can give a nice exegetical insight doesn't mean you should follow what he says. <laughs> okay? And so, you know, the, uh, something to be aware of. All right. Uh, any comments, questions about that? Okay. So, overview here. We're going to be learning the first and second declension personal pronouns. So, sounds good, you know, personal pronouns, you know? It's like the personal watermelons, you know? Don't you just feel like that? Those ones, that are per they're personal watermelons, like... Just have it for yourself. So we're going to be learning personal pronouns here. Uh, pronouns case is, the we're going to learn the third personal personal pronouns, chapter 12. All right. So a uh, few more third declension stems. So first and second declension personal pronouns. Pronouns case is determined by its function and its sentence, just like the noun. And the pronouns number is determined by its antecedent and more third declension patterns. And I just realized something about the professor here. I thought those were his knees and his feet were behind him and they couldn't see them. Those are his shoes. Did you know those are the shoes of the professor? Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, you're ahead of me. You're ahead of me in this. This is, this is impressive. <laughs> yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess he's standing on, that's, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, so he's so happy. Happy little guy. All right. If I had to teach wearing one of those, you know, Graduation robes, I don't know if I'd be that happy, but he was happy, so it's good. All right, so what is, let's talk about a little English here.
Because if you don't know no English, that's a problem. So what is a pronoun? Oh, let me get my slides up here. OK, English. Uh, oh, this chapter two, it's a shorter chapter. You've learned a lot of the stuff in here already. That's a good thing. So it's a pr relatively easy chapter. So that's a blessing. So what's a pronoun? A pronoun is a word that replaces a noun, refers back to a noun. So if I say, give it to me. No. no. <laughs> give it to me, the it is a pronoun that refers back to something. It, give it, whatever it is. And we use the word antecedent to designate what the pronoun is referring back to. All right? So if I say, give it to me, it is the pronoun, refers back to antecedent, you know, the book, cupcake, plain oatmeal, no sweeteners, whatever it is, uh, give it, okay? And then you can have personal pronouns. Those are pronouns whose antecedent is, what do you think? A person? Yeah. Person. So if I say give it to me, and me is a personal pronoun, then the antecedent would be a person. So um, maybe uh, didaskalos ross, you know, the T could be the antecedent. So you have pronouns, we have personal pronouns. Now, I wish I had learned Hebrew here instead of Greek, I guess, I don't know. But uh, th that could be your sentence. Or, uh, and antecedents are the words the pronouns are referring back to. A few other things. For English grammar, what is a person? Uh, there are three persons, not only in English grammar, but also in the Trinity, of course. Hebrews 1.3 actually uses the word person to refer to one of the subsistences in the Godhead, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It says that the Son is the brightness of the Father's, uh, or is the uh, express image of the Father's person. So that terminology, of the, if, when anti-Trinitarians say, you shouldn't call God persons. Where does the Bible say that? Hebrews 1.3 actually does that. Greek hypothesis, the traditional Greek word for the person of the Trinity. But we're talking about English grammar right now here. Uh, we may, maybe you can speculate later about the nature of God and the way he reveals himself in language. Now language has three persons too, but that would definitely be speculative. But there's three persons for, in, in English grammar, first person, second person, third person. And this is similar in English and in Greek. So in English, the person who is speaking is the first person, I, okay, I, or we. We is the first person plural. The second person is you in modern English, or in the authorized version, thee, thou, thy, or ye, or you, all right? And the subjective, possessive, and objective forms of the first person pronouns are I, my, and me. So I is subjective, my is possessive, and objective is me. And in the plural, we have we are and us. We is a subjective, possessive is our, objective, a plural is us. Second person in contemporary modern English is less inflected. It's you, except for the possessive is your. Okay? So that's a little less, um, less inflected. In early modern English, we had more of a distinction. We have the thou as a subjective, thy is the possessive, thee is the objective for the um, second person singular, ye is the subjective for the um, second person plural, your is the second person possessive, and you is the second person objective. So there's a distinction in all those forms. And again, of course, we mentioned this already, but the authorized version is not Old English or Middle English, it's early modern English. Did they ever get, get, you want to hear an example of modern, Middle English? You've heard Middle English before? You have? Okay, good. Then I won't do it. So, you're okay with an example? Okay, this is the beginning of the Canterbury Tales. One that April with the Shura Sota, the Drucht of March hath passed to the Rota, and bathed every vine in sweet liquor of which vertu engendered is the floor. One Zephyrus ache with his sweet breath, in spirit hath in every holt and hath a tender acropis. And the youngest son hath in the ram is how the cool is a runa, and small a fool is mark and melodia, that sleep in all the nicht with open ear, so pricketh him natur in here courages, than a longen folk to go on, on pilgrimages, and palmeres, for whose sake and strangest throne this infernal hall was cooth in sundry londes, and specially from every sheer as ende of Engeland to Canterbury they wende, the holy blissful marty of for to 
that him hath hope in one that they were sick. Now, do you think that's harder to understand than the King James? <laughs> if that's Middle English, if the King James is Old English, we'd be in trouble, right? So th this is early modern. The King James is early modern English, right? And actually, Middle English is easier to read than, than to say it. You can learn Middle English probably a few hours, at least to get by. It's kind of fun. But I, I took a class on the Canterbury Tales when I was an English major at UC Berkeley. You know, peace, man. But, um, but it was, uh, you know, you learned some Middle English. You had a, a big book. It's pretty neat. Anyway, but uh, this is early modern English. Thee, thou, thy, ye, and your. Not Middle English, not Old English. Uh, I added, Mounts has a chart on page 92, 11.4 uh, in BBG. I, my, me, we are ours, you, your, you, your, your. I would suggest adding the King James forms in there on the second person, you know, next to you putting thou, you are putting thy, and the, the ye and your, just so you actually have them in there, both. So when you're reading the Bible in English, you know what it's actually rendering in the original language. The different, because each of these different forms is a different form of the, the Greek pronoun. And also, if you want to do that when you translate, which you don't have to, but if you want to do it that way when you translate, so at least you know what is going on there. Footnote 2, BBG 11.6 is also help. Uh, footnote 2, excuse me, 11.2. Page 91 is also useful. He gives you the thou, thy stuff down there. So um, that's not on the chart on page 92, but he does have it in the footnote, the thou, thy, thine stuff. So that's nice that he has that down there. And he says another option is use you for the singular and y'all for the plural. So, but we can't because we're in Wisconsin, not Alabama. I guess we still could so now, I would suggest, though, just doing something in your translation to distinguish the singular and plural, either employ the early modern English forms, or when speaking, say, you or y'all, something like that. But, uh, or you could even um, maybe make one all caps to be the, the plural, and then the singular could be lowercase or something like that. But I would suggest doing something to make a, a distinction, because... Uh, the early modern English is very accurate because it distinguishes all six forms every time. But if that's a little too archaic for y'all, uh, then you can offer something different. All right. So and note that the distinction is not in the King James that thou is more formal or when one is speaking to God. It's singular versus plural. All right. So that's all we needed to say about the pronoun there, 11.2. Any comments, questions about that? I'd say just pick something and be consistent with it in your translation. All right, 11.3 are the forms of the pronouns. What determines the case of the Greek pronouns? It's function in the sentence. So if you wanted to, one of the first person pronoun, and you wanted to be the subject, you would not say me, but you'd say ego, I, uh, not the accusative form me. Just like in English, you would say I and not me. So the form is determined by the function. Uh, you would say I will eat now, not me will eat now. Okay, wrong form there. In Greek, first and second personal pronouns do not have different forms based on gender. So that's in English, they don't do that either. So they don't, you know, you don't have a different one for the masculine and feminine. In terms of person and number for pronouns, they're both determined by the antecedent. So the antecedent is plural, the pronoun is going to be plural. If the antecedent is second person, the pronoun is going to be second person. So Greek is just like English in, in these matters. So that's nice. Here's our Greek paradigm of the first and second person pronouns. Here, I don't have the early modern ones on the chart because this is Mounts' slide, and it's a really nice slide, and I didn't bother re redoing it. But, so here's your paradigm. 
notice the letters in yellow. They're technically not case endings, but they help you because they're similar to case endings that you already know. So this genitive, upsilon, the date of Yoda, uh, those are technically not case endings, but they're similarities and they're, they're helpful to you. So in the first person, we begin with ego, I, and then in the genitive, we get mu. Mu. Now, you're probably used to, if you're not used to, that's a problem, actually, at this point. You're probably used to seeing an, upsil, uh, an omicron upsilon at the end of a genitive form. Logos, logu, ha. Right? So you can probably remember that mu is the genitive singular, meaning my. Mu is also the favorite form uh, for cows, the Greek cows, like the form mu. Now, in the dative singular, the case ending is yoda, so we get moi to me. And then in the accusative singular goes to me, me. And here if you transliterate me, it becomes me. That's a nice little mnemonic device. Accusative me. English is me. The, the uh, direct object form is the same. That's a nice little mnemonic device. Um, you could work really hard to figure out what the true case endings are and all these things, but with the pronouns it's easier just to memorize the forms of the pronoun. And are pronouns in English pretty common? Do you use I and we and are a lot? We do. We do? <laughs> yeah, we do. So same thing with Greek. They're, they're used a lot. So you should really, you, you, should, you need to memorize the forms. It's, it's, it's a good idea. So they occur so often, you need to know them so well that you, y'all, should just memorize them. All right? Now, if we move over to the second person, you see basically the same pattern. So first we have the lawyer's favorite form, Sue. And then after that, after the Sue, you could see the same endings as on the first person singular. So um, uh, Sue with that Omicron Upsilon, just like Mu. Soy, Omicron, Yoda, just like Moi. Se. Epsilon ending just like, or technically not ending, sa just like meh, right? So you see that correspondence. So that's good. It's very, very nice. And moving on to the plurals, the endings again for the first and second persons are identical. The only difference, well, what is the only difference? What's the only difference between the first person plural nominative and the first person singular and the second person Nominative, plural. First letter. First letter. First letter. Like, hey, that's good. Yeah, you, you just turn the letter upside down. Yeah, hey, Mace, you flip the, the, hey, the, uh, the eta over to become an upsilon. Oops, flip it upside <laughs> down. And there you go. You got it. That, that's good, actually. I like that. That's, that's a good, uh, that might help you. So, so the first person begins with an eta. Second person begins with an upsilon. And of course, typically people like to blame somebody else when they make a mistake, so that you, Upsilon, <laughs> so uh, it wasn't me, no, no, hey Mace, it wasn't us. So otherwise they're identical, you know, evidence of indwelling sin and everybody doing that. So hey Mace is we, hey Moan is our, hey Min to us, and hey Mas, us. And then in the second person, we have who Mace, who Moan, who Min, and who Mas, forms that again are identical in every way except the initial letter. Um, Mounts actually suggested a mnemonic device on footnote 4 and 11.7 that since upsilon with a rough breathing makes a who sound, okay, upsilon, or who mace, who mace, who moan, who min, you can remember by associating who with sue, you can think sue, who, Second person, so that helps you, it's fine. Um, or you could just say boo and who, and then I know that you didn't like it because you're crying. Now, by the way, the hey, it's hey, uh, hey, min, hey mean, not hey min. The Yoda is long on the second person. I don't even remember off, I, I said it right when I did it. So but it's who mace, who moan. Who mean, not who men, who mean, 
humas. How do we know that that yoda is long? We know it's long because it has a circumflex accent. And the circumflex can only stand over a long vowel, not a short vowel. Okay? I guess it goes up and down, so it's long. You know, the voice goes up and down. So, um, you think people flex, you know, it's, it's big. So, uh, you would pronounce the second person plural as who mean, not who men. Who mean. So, who mace, who moan, who mean, who mas. Okay, so um, questions on those forms? What are, what's the purpose of the ones in the parentheses? Oh, good you asked. I was just about to tell you. Why are there, what are the ones in the parentheses? Shows the great minds think alike, he asked, I was about to say. And ours do as well, so that's good. Now, um, the ones in the parentheses, why are they there? Uh, they're emphatic forms. So it has more umpa if you say emu instead of mu, or emoi instead of moi. They add a little extra punch to what you're saying. So emu emphasizes the my a little bit more. So normally the emphasis is a matter of contrast. I did this, but you did that. Something like that then you might have the emphatic forms, the amu, the amoy, the ame, the su, soy, se, right? But you shouldn't hang an overly large amount of exegetical weight on the different forms, but that is the difference. They're more emphatic, a little bit more emphatic. And the emphatic forms are almost always used when pronouns are the objects of prepositions as well. So if you have a preposition, you have n, you're more likely to have the emphatic form. In that case, there is no emphasis. It's just they typically use those forms after the preposition. So there you wouldn't want to hang too much exegetical weight on that. So in the first person, <coughs> first person singular, they have the genitive, dative, and accusative emphatic. You add an epsilon in front. So instead of mu, you say emu. Instead of moi, you say emoi. Instead of me, you say eme. Stick that epsilon right in the front. And in the second person forms, they are written the same as the non-emphatic forms, except they have an accent. So su has no accent. It loses its accent to the word before it, but su keeps its own accent. Soy loses its accent to the word before. Soy keeps the accent. It's emphatic. And note that the second person nominative singular form, su, always has an accent in the Greek New Testament, so that is not necessarily emphatic. So there's a slight emphasis with these emphatic forms unless they're the object of prepositions, but don't place too much weight on them. Let's go ahead and say them all together. We'll say the, we'll go through, we'll say them. First person all the way through, singular, plural. Second person all the way through, singular, plural. And then we'll do it again with the, um, we'll just say the non-emphatic forms, and then we'll go through it a second time, we'll say it with the emphatic ones. All right? No, yeah, the plurals are just, just what they are. And actually, Let's make this, well, okay. Second time through, we're going to have you point to ego huma, humes, right? And you have to point to more than one person when it's plural, okay? So, all right, but we're not, we'll only do that the second time, right? And you don't have to rub your tummy and pat your head, all right? Ego, mu, moi, me, he mes, he moan, Hey mean, hey mas, su, su, soy, se, who mace, who moan, who mean, who mas. You can see that the the su and the the su and the su, the uh, nominative and the genitive, they sound pretty similar. All right. Now we'll say it. Actually, since at, we'll do it with third time. We'll do it with pointing a third time because this is. With saying the emphatic form is a little complicated. So, ego, mu or emu, moi or emoi, me or eme, he mace, he moan, he mean, he mas, su, su or su, soy or soy, se or se, who mace, who moan, who mean, who mas. Okay, now we're going to point. We're just going to say the non-emphatic forms. Ego, 
mu, moi, me, hames, hamon, hamin, hamas. That's me and the people of my group. Yo, bro, me and my people. Okay? Su, su, soy, se, humes, humon, humin, humas. Okay? Yeah. So you can point that out. Good. All right. And as you, as you do the conversation of coin A2, this is obviously very useful. You can actually address people. Okay, so slight emphasis with the emphatic forms, not too much. Please memorize these forms. Let's talk about the grammar for the prepositions. And you know when the video is up too, like you, if you, you could just like play that part over and over again while you're driving, well, while driving your car or something, or put it on a flashcard. I, I would put them all on a flashcard, all the forms, and just recite them when you're standing in line or um, when you go to uh, the charismatic church. You can say, Ego mu moi me, heme sumon, hume And they'll think that you're saying something amazing. And you can tell them when they translate it and they say it's whatever else, it's not. You just say, no, I was saying, I am I to me to me, me. But you'd be probably better off not going there. All right, so Greek grammar. Um, what determines the form of the Greek pronoun? The same thing as in English. So the case is determined by the function. I think we said that already. If you want to use the first person pronoun as a subject of a sentence, you will use the nominative form ego. Okay? Uh, not the accusative form me. So the case is determined by its function, number and person determined by the antecedent, which again is just like in English. What about parsing? Uh, so when you parse pronouns, you want to say the case, the number, and then the person. That's how the workbook does it, the BBG workbook. So for example, for mu, you would say it's genitive, I'll go back here, so you have mu, you'd say mu is genitive singular first person pronoun from ego, meaning my. So moi would be a dative singular first person pronoun from ego, meaning my. Su would be a genitive singular uh, second person pronoun from um, su, meaning your, okay, something like that. That's how you'd say it. Now, in the plural, we have a little bit, and you give us the example there on the, on the chart. Mu, genitive, singular, first person, from ago, meaning mine. Now, the plurals are a little unusual because the plural, nominative plural, hemes, and the nominative singular, ego, they don't look like they're the same word, do they? Ego to hemes. I mean, I guess weird things happen. The, you have common words. Common words do weird things. Right? They can be chaotic in how they, you say them. Oh, excuse me, chaotic. I guess that's not said right. So, uh, but you can have that happen now. So you have some people that argue, is this, is hey men, is the lexical form really hey mace, we, or is the lexical form really I go, I? Which is it? Mounts suggests we go back to the singular, even though it looks very different than the plural. Uh, in 11.9, in the textbook, he says some teachers view ego as the lexical form of hemes, while others see hemes as a separate word. The same holds true for humes. And I, I would agree that considering ego and su as the lexical forms is indeed best versus considering them as uh, different words from the plurals, uh, if for no other reason, for pedagogical reasons and for practicality. Bible software programs like Accordance will do this. So if you have humon, it won't tell you the lexical form is humase. It'll tell you the lexical form is su. So that's what the Bible programs do. If you look under hemes and bdag, it'll say hemes si ego. Okay. So it'll send you back to ego, and the actual entry for ego with whatever, all the blah, 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 will be under ego. So if I were to ask you to parse humon, uh, you would say genitive plural first person uh, pronoun from ego, not from humes, uh, hemes rather, meaning our. Okay, so just say ego and sewer the lexical forms, even though they look pretty different. Comments, questions about that? I don't think it's too bad. 
In terms of translation, the pronouns are pretty straightforward. There are no surprises. But we're going to need to say something about the possessive. To say my Lord in Greek, you would say kuriosmu. Now, two things to note there. First, the possessive form follows the noun it modifies. That's not surprising. The mu is after the kurios, modifying it. But notice that the Greek is not kurios to mu. Lord, and then you have the, the article, the me. It's just kurios mu. When you have a personal pronoun functioning as possessive in the genitive, my, your, thy, it's not going to be articular. So you're not going to find an article in front of it, although you might suspect if it was a different adjective, there might be one. So the personal pronoun functioning as a possessive is always anarthrous, always non-articular. It'll always be kurios mu. You're never going to see kurios tu mu in the Greek New Testament. That's just one of the things the pronoun does. Now, that doesn't really affect your translation. I mean, if you see kurios mu, you just translate it as my lord, but it's something to be aware of, or if you ever wanted to translate English back into Greek. Okay, so that's good. So let's go to our halftime review. Halftime review here. 11.10. That's pretty quick getting to halftime already. I'll put it up on the screen. Oh, we'll talk about the little phrases like poseches, how art thou? Halftime review. So pronouns are words that replace nouns. Pronouns are first, the person speaking. Second person, the one spoken to. Third person, the one spoken about. First and second person pronouns agree with their antecedent in person and number. And the case is determined by their function in the sentence. The forms, forms of the personal pronouns need to be memorized. They're important. Memorize them. Personal pronouns used in oblique cases. Oblique cases are everything but the nominative. And those cases can have accents when they are used emphatically. So the oblique, the non-nominative ones can have accents. Think you got that? Do you all have it? Okay, good. Let's talk about the third declension. 11.11. .11. There are several types. We saw in chapter 10 some third declension stems. Uh, there, we're going to see that there's uh, five different kinds of third declension stems, but they're not that bad. The first three are all dentals, and we're going to see they're very consistent in the way that they form their different cases. And there's really nothing new here, just a few odds and ends, so you don't need to be worried about it. And you shouldn't be worried anyway, because the Bible says you should trust in God not worry, right? So let's take a look at the forms, but I can still encourage you, I can exhort you. So here we have the word grace, charis, caritas, he, with the stem carit. Let's go ahead and say the forms. Charis, caritas, cariti, carita, or on. Carites, cariton, carisi, caritas. And in the vocabulary, of course, you have the nominative, the genitive, and the article. So the vocabulary will list it as charis, caritas, he. So the he tells us that it's neuter, right? Feminine. feminine. Yeah, good. So somebody's paying attention. So the he tells you it's feminine. You drop the os from the genitive to get the stem. Remember, you shouldn't try to get stems from nominative. So you get the stem from the genitive, drop the os ending, stem is caris. And it ends in uh, tau, which is a dental. Quick review of the square of stops here. Remember the square of stops? You need to memorize the square of stops. Square of stops, important. So you have the labials, P, beta, and phi, which with sigma form psi. The velars, kappa, gamma, chi, form xi. The dentals, tau, delta, theta, form sigma. 
the voiceless, the voice, and the aspirated ones. And actually, this morning, um, I woke up a little bit and I went back to bed, and I had the square of stops in my head. So it was good. You know, when you know you have the square of stops down when it comes in your head in the morning. So, uh, what are we going to do? So anyway, so that's square of stops. If you don't have it memorized, you want to memorize square of stops. It's important. So, what is this? Charis, karatas, karati, what, what's going to happen here? Uh, now, in the paradigm, the tau, oops, so um, what happens in the square of stops when you add a sigma after, when you have a tau and then you add a sigma? What happens? Yeah, it turns to sigma, basically you lose it, okay? And you can kind of see that, notice like in the karasi, that tau goes away, right? It's not karit c, it's karasi in the dative plural. So that dental, or in the charis, it's not karit charis, though nominative sounds do weird things. So that is what you would expect here. So in the nominative, the case ending is sigma, and hint four from chapter 10 tells you that tau drops out when followed by sigma, or at the end of a word, so the tau drops off before the sigma, leaving us with charis. Then the genitive singular is karatos. The dative singular is karati. Accusative singular is karin. Now, accusative singular is karin. BBG says it's karata. Now, on the slide here, which I borrowed from Mounts, he has karata slash karin. I left it alone so you could see what BBG says is going on and what's really going on. Now, there is a footnote here, foot on pay 11.11, .11, we're in 11.11 .11 here, and on, he has karata as the accusative singular form, is his footnote, and it says alpha is using the accusative singular by all the New Testament words in this category, except for charis. And then he says uh, charis is karin 42 times, twice it's karata. That's what he says. Now, he gives you two verses that he says have the form karata, Acts 24, 27, and Jude 4. Now, in the re received text, in Acts 24, 27, you have the feminine plural accusative karatos, not the accusative singular karata. So, and 97% of Greek manuscripts follow the, the TR, which probably shouldn't surprise you. So there is no karata in the preserved word of God in Acts 24, 27. And then in Jude 4, the TR has the accusative singular car in. Not the CT has accusative singular car ta. Here the TR follows 99.2% of manuscripts, and the CT follows 8%. So actually the form car ta uh, is uh, the note here of BBG is inaccurate. It, it's never in the New Testament at all. So there is no form car ta in the New Testament. It's just car in. All right? Uh, Wilbur Pickering, Dr. Wilbur Pickering, noted on Jude 4, he said, another, uh, commenting on the karata, he said, it's another inferior Alexandrian variant. The proper form of the accusative is karin, occurring over 40 times in the New Testament. Karata occurs only as an Alexandrian variant, and even so, only here and in Acts 24.27, where they just drop the sigma. So in Acts 24.27, it's also not karata, but karatas. So the real accusative singular form is karin, with the tau going away, but this is something that is an oddity of charis. The other dental stems do end with tau alpha. Okay, so there are other dental stems that end in tau alpha. Just charin isn't not one of them. It's just charin. So you might want to note that in your book, uh, just so you aren't memorizing a form that's actually not in the New Testament. So charis, karatas, karati, karin, karates, karaton. Karasi, karatas. In the plural, there are no big surprises here. You have karates, then the plural, genitive plural, karitone. Data plural, the dental drops off for the sigma because of the square of stops, leaving us with karasi. What's that new? What do you think that new is in parentheses? On karasi. Good, it's movable new, movable new. And then the accusative plural, you have karatas. So very straightforward. 
The only unusual thing on this word is the accusative singular karin. Everything else is what you would expect. Any questions on karis karitas hey? Third declension noun. Wait, you said, we, we said, ka, you said, I think you said the wrong letter. It's, it, yeah, Karin. Yeah. You said Kai. It's not a Kai. So think about the Kai. It's not a Kai. <laughs> so, so yes, Ki. Ki, Alpha, Rho, Yoda, Tau, Nu. Karin is the form. It's what Mounts says in footnote number eight is found 42 times. It's actually found every time. So Karin is the form. You won't actually see Karata in the New Testament. I mean, that's not to say you won't find it somewhere in first century Greek, in a papyrus somewhere, but you won't actually find it in the uh, New Testament. Y'all looking at it, trying to see what I'm talking about with uh, those different forms? Here, I'll show you. So Acts 24, 27. Oops, the book SC cannot be found. Okay, Acts. So Acts 24, 27, let's put up the... Uh, Greek CT as well. Oops. So here, uh, Felix willing to show the Jews a pleasure. Okay. So notice in the TR you have karatas, and the CD has that karata. Okay. So you see that distinction there in the blue word, and then. In the Jude 4, so there is no karata in the TR there. Then Jude 4, you have the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, karin in the TR and karata in the CT. So you see the distinction there? So yeah, so that's what he's talking about. Okay, any other uh, thoughts, comments on that? Percentages. In Jude 4, 99.2% of the manuscripts have Karin and 0.8% have the CT form. And in Acts 24, 27, 97% have the TR form and 3% have the CT form. 97 and 3. All right. Let's talk about Fos. So, phos, photosta, is the word light. What is a photon? It's a light particle. It's a massless light particle, right? So, if you remember a photon, phos is light. Phos, photosta. So, in the nominative, of course, you have phos. The genitive is photos. The article is ta, so it is neuter. We drop the os from the genitive form photos to get the stem phot. Now, one of the oddities of photo, phos photos, is even though it's neuter third declension, you have a sigma as a case ending in the nominative. Because normally you don't have that case ending in the nominative and the accusative, but we do. Now, we've seen sigma as a nominative case ending before, so it's something we're used to, seeing a sigma as a nominative case ending. But here we have it on a neuter third declension word. That's a little odd, but just this is a sub-pattern of the neuter third declension. Since we memorized the vocabulary form as phos, photosta, though, that shouldn't be a problem for us. And so, uh, remember that the nominative singular is frequently the most unusual form anyway, so don't get your stem from it. You get it here again from, you memorize the nominative singular and the genitive, and then you're going to be fine. Why is it the nominative if the stem is fot, why isn't the nominative fotes with a tau sigma? Good. The tau gets dropped because the square stops. Yeah. Tau sigma, drop the tau, you just get a sigma. Because the dental, your tooth falls out, right? So um, that's why. That's right. So you just have fos. Because the square stops. So, phos, photos, dative, singular is foti. 
And the accusative singular, because it's neuter, has to be the same as the nominative. So it's fos again. You go over to the plural. Plural is perfectly regular. You have phot phota, photon, foci. And here, the tau again drops out before the sigma because of the square of stops. That's why it's foci and not foci. So foci with that movable nu. And then because it's neuter, the accusative has to be the same as the nominative, so it's phota again. So phos, photosta. Any questions about that? It follows the rules. Uh, the square of stops you're going to see not just in the third decline, you're going to see the square of stops come up in multiple situations. It's going to help you with verbs too. So, for nouns, yeah, I, I think that I'm, I, for nouns you're going to see it in, because the noun, the third declension nouns have that consonant at the end, so that's where it kind of comes into play. So yeah, with the, with the earl, that's why they, he introduced it later after the first and second declension ones, because you there, you didn't have that consonant at the end. So, you know how the alphabet, so they sing that song, about, they say constantly abiding. In the alphabet, they sing that song. But yeah, so you, anyway, um, so phos, photos, is a good question? So yeah, square stops have come up a lot. Any other questions about phos, photos, though? Okay. Third dental stem ends in a delta, appropriate for a dental stem. This is the word hope. Elpis, elpidos, hey. Stem elpid. Vocabulary tells us the nominative is elpis, genitive form elpidos. Stem is elpid. Article is hey, so we know this is a feminine noun. Why is there no delta in the nominative? Why is it elpis and not elpids? Square stops, Square stops. yep. Square stops. Um, drops from the end of the stem. So elpis, elpidos, dative singular elpidi, accusative singular elpida. Plurals, elpides, elpidon. Again, because the square of stops, that sigma makes it elpisi, not elpidsi. Um, dental, square of stops. And then you have accusative singular elpidos. Perfectly regular here, no surprises. Let's say these, elpis. Elpidos, elpidi, elpida, elpides, elpidon, elpisi, elpidos. You go. So now we're on 11, 12 through 14 in BBG. Here we, uh, this word is a little bit more unusual. We have the Greek word for faith, pistis. Pistis, pistaos, hey. Pistis, pistaos, hey, faith. So a little more unusual, you have a yoda before the final sigma, and that yoda before the final sigma causes things to be a little more unusual. So we memorize the form as pistis, pistaos, hey. Now there's something quite useful here. We've already learned one gender pattern. All third declension words with a mot stem are neuter. So new mot. Ta, numa, numa ta. So the words were wind or spirit. All mot stems are neuter. All third declension words of the same pattern as pistis, pistaos hey, are all feminine. So that's nice. So the pistis, pistaos words are all feminine, just like the mot stems are all neuter. So that's kind of a nice thing. Now the genitive singular looks a bit unusual here. The yoda has gone to an epsilon. The Omicron has become an Omega. So what is happening here? We're going to be introducing you here to a character called the consonantal Yoda. So Yoda, you think of Yoda as a vowel. Here we have a consonantal Yoda. The Greek alphabet used to have more characters than it does in the time when God gave us the New Testament. And they dropped off many centuries before the New Testament was inspired. But their presence can still leave a little bit of a fingerprint in the language. So this now extinct consonantal yota helps us to understand what's going on in pistis, pistaos, hey. Now, we're going to go over the rules here that explain what's happening with it. And if the rules are a little too complicated, memorizing the pattern may just be better. So maybe better for you to learn the rules, maybe better if you just memorize it, maybe better do both. Um, but this is the explanation so you know. 
and just learn it whichever way is better for you. And when you see what's happening, then pistis pistos is actually pretty regular. So when there was a con when the consonantal yoda dropped out of the Greek language, it was replaced by either an epsilon or a yoda, a normal yoda, vowel yoda for the most part. So the basic rule here is if the case ending begins with a consonant, the consonantal yoda was replaced with a simple yoda. But if the case ending begins with a vowel, then the consonantal yoda was replaced with an epsilon for the most part. So if you see, if you apply that to this paradigm, you can see what's going on. So you have the, you have the stem pissed, and you can see that if the letter after the tau of the stem pissed is either an epsilon or a yoda. You have pissed this, then you have pissed eos, pissed a, then pissed in, pissed ace, pissed eon, pissed esi, pissed ace. So uh, in every case, you have that either epsilon or yoda before, uh, after the pissed, right? And in the genitive singular, uh, and in every case, whether it's an epsilon or yoda is determined by the first letter of the case ending. So in the genitive singular, the vowel is, there's an omega here. The omega is a vowel. Since the omega is a vowel, you have an epsilon, pisteos. In the accusative, the nu is a consonant, piston. And so you have, you have a regular yoda, piston. You have an um, yoda, then you have the sigma. All right. The only time this rule is broken is for the data plural. We have an epsilon before the consonant and sigma. Uh, in pistesi, that's the, every other time if what comes after that epsilon or, um, or yoda, if it's a consonant, you know, then you've got an, a, a yoda. If it's a vowel, you've got an epsilon. All right. So that's the rule. Now for parsing this word correctly, you don't actually need to remember whether the extinct consonantal yoda becomes a normal yoda or an epsilon. You just need to recognize the endings, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, So that's kind of nice. Uh, just remembering that it becomes one or the other will solve the problem for you. So you can either think uh, of this as an exception, or you can state the rule the way Mounts does on page 95 of BBG in 11.13. So he says on page 95 there, if the case ending begins with a vowel, the final stem is an epsilon. If the case ending begins with a consonant, the final stem vowel is a yoda. But in the dative plural, epsilon precedes a sigma. So you can just think about it that way. And if you do that, then that's, that's OK. So let's go through the forms of pistis here. So the nominative singular is pistis. Genitive singular, you have pistos. This is the normal third declension omicron sigma ending, but the omicron is, omicron is lengthened to an omega. It's oblot. Do you remember what oblot is? Vowels frequently yes, vowels frequently change lengths. Page 47 of BBG, oblot is change of length in vowels. So vowels, omicron, think of omicron and omega. Omicron is a short O, omega is a long O. They just do that sometimes. So uh, pistis pistaos. Dative singular of piste, accusative, it uses that alternative accusative singular ending nu instead of alpha, so it's piston, kind of like with charis, so you have that nu, carin. So this particular pattern of third declension nouns uses nu as the accusative singular case ending, uh, Mount says in footnote 11, page 95. Moving on to the plural, you have pistes. What's happening there is you have an epsilon and the end the ending is epsilon sigma, but we can't have piste s with two epsilons next to each other. So the epsilon epsilon changes into epsilon yoda, and you have pistes. And you have a footnote in BBG where he says, uh, in the nominative case ending, we have uh, this, the nominative case ending is the same as karates, piste plus s goes to pistase, epsilon, epsilon, contracting to epsilon, yoda. Uh, the accusative plural uses the same case ending as the nominative plural, just as if the word were neuter. So pistase and the nominative and accusative are the same. 
basically, so that's the explanation, but instead of remembering all that, you probably just memorize pistes, okay? <laughs> and you'll be all right. So genitive plural, you have pis to own. Notice here the omega doesn't swallow up the epsilon. In the first and second declensions, remember the omega ending tends to swallow up the ending. Um, this is because the epsilon used to be the consonantal yoda. That's why it's still there. In the dative plural, you have pistasy, with that movable nu. And then accusative plural, you have pistes. Now, if you just saw this paradigm and you saw the word with a nominative and accusative plural with the same form, you would think, oh, this must be neuter. Accusative and nominative have the same form of the plural. Mounts calls words like this neuter wannabes. They want to act like neuters and that they have the same form in the nominative and accusative plural, even though they're not neuter. All right. That's simply a peculiarity of the pistis type words. They have identical nominative and accusative forms, even though they're feminine and not neuter. So to summarize all that, consonantal yoda, which is the pistis pistaos type, third declension words are words where there was a consonantal yoda. All right? Those type of words are always feminine. So that's nice. This is a sub-pattern of the third declension. Shouldn't be that shouldn't be a problem for you. Uh, you should probably maybe just memorize the forms of pistis. And then every time you see a word, every other type of word where you have this type of third declension pattern, you'll be fine. You can memorize the rules about how it does this and that. That's fine too. Or even just review it. But if you just memorize it, you're probably fine. And faith is, of course, a common word in the New Testament. So you'll see it. I just want to mention, since we're talking about the word faith, um, exegetical insight here, Habakkuk 2.4 says the just shall live by his faith, which is referring back to Genesis 15.6, where it says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And in the New Testament books of James, Galatians, Romans, and Hebrews, we see crucial aspects of the relationship of how faith relates to salvation. In Habakkuk 2.4, the word for faith, the Hebrew word is a type of faith that always results in faithfulness. It's, you can't exclude the faithfulness that results from the faith in Habakkuk 2, 4. In fact, the word is usually translated faithfulness in the King James. Uh, but the just live by his faith, and that faith will always result in faithfulness. And so not surprisingly, in James chapter 2, uh, Abraham's godly life, where it says, you know, he's proving that faith without works is dead, in James chapter 2, Abraham's godly life was so certain a result of his faith that the works were said to be fulfillment of his saving faith. If you look in James chapter 2, it says, uh, and the scripture was fulfilled, saying Abraham believed God and has counted him for righteousness. So Abraham's life of faith, the works that resulted, were so certain that the Bible says it's a fulfillment of him believing. Just like pro prophetic fulfillment, prophecy when it's fulfilled is certain, Right? So like, well, maybe God's prophecies will fail. Maybe they won't. Maybe they will. It was a certain thing. So you can actually say that works resulting from saving faith are so certain that James can say it's a fulfillment. It's fulfilling that. All right? So James is emphasizing that saving faith results in works, just like Habakkuk 2, faith results in faithfulness. Uh, in Galatians, the just shall live by faith, which is very key, central to the book of Galatians, that emphasizes that one is justified before God. He's declared righteous. He enters in his spiritual life through the instrumentality of faith alone, not by the works of law. So the just shall live by faith. That shows you're declared just at the moment of faith. That's what Galatians is emphasizing. It's not by works. By, by, by faith alone, you're, you're justified. In Romans, the just shall live by faith is actually the thesis statement of the whole book. And just like it's actually was a thesis statement in Habakkuk, Habakkuk's thesis statement is the just shall live by his faith. And Romans, the thesis statement is the just shall live by his faith. And how does that break down in Romans? In Romans, people need justification by faith alone because of their sin. That's chapters 1 through 3. Uh, chapters 4 and 5 show you're justified at the moment of faith apart from the works of the law, like Abraham was. Chapters 6 through 8 show that justification by faith leads to a certain life of faith. Uh, Romans 9 through 11 show that the certainty of God's promises to believers are not undermined by the alleged lack of fulfillment to Israel. Because he's saying, well, what happened with Israel in Romans 9 through 11? And then Romans 12, 1 through 15, 13 Paul exhorts the Romans to a bunch of practical duties based on that this shows this is what should adorn the life of those who by faith are just. That's 12, 1 through 15, 13. And then in 15, 13, which concludes the main body of the book of Romans, 
uh, that uh, which began with a thesis statement of the just Levites faith in 1, 16, 17. And Romans 15, 13 indicates that the uh, Romans 1 where it says, uh, it talks about from faith to faith. That shows that God fills the saints with all joy and peace as they believe and by means of their faith. So faith is a human response through which God makes the believer holy, filling him with joy and peace and hope. And so that's how Joshua Levites faith breaks down in Romans. And then Paul also quotes Habakkuk 2, 4 in Hebrews. In Hebrews 10, 38, um, he, he quotes the just live by his faith, and he says, uh, If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So in Hebrews, the just live by his faith emphasizes that those who believe to the saving of their souls, who are declared righteous at the moment of faith, will persevere. While those who draw back, those who apostatize, instead of persevering, draw back to perdition, and they're damned. Um, so actually, Hebrews 11 is an example of people who have, don't draw back to perdition, but believe to the saving of the soul. That's what Hebrews 11 actually illustrates, right after Hebrews 10. So, uh, so Paul sets forth that truth as an encouragement to the believing Hebrews to persevere in their faith, despite, pers despite persecution, and as a warning that those who apostatize from Christ and return to Judaism will not just receive freedom from persecution, but receive eternal damnation. So, a little background, just to live by his faith is actually Genesis 15, key verse of Hebrews, uh, or Habakkuk 2.4, and key to four books of the New Testament, James, Galatians, Romans, Hebrews. So, so that's, you know, maybe you should memorize the forms that were pissed this then, right? So, um, Save your, your, the New Testament doctrine of faith is you're saved by faith apart from any and all works. You're justified by faith alone. But saving faith also never remains alone. It always results in faithfulness and good works. Uh, comments, questions about pistis pistos? Hey. You can study that. I have a, on part of my dissertation, the chapter, uh, it, I wrote a chapter called The Just Shall Live by Faith, the study of faith's connection with salvation and all its justifying, sanctifying, glorifying fullness. Looked up the pistis word group and the whole New Testament, the equivalent of the Old Testament. If you want to study out that word group, check that study out. The whole word group studied out. It was a blessing to study it. Okay, let's go on to pater, patros, huh? By the way, like in Hebrews, as you draw back to perdition, that's not just some sort of like chastisement. Perdition is hell. You don't want to get perdition. It's a bad situation. I mean, chastisement's bad too, but hell is worse. All right. Pater patrasha, the word for father. Lexical form, the genitive is um, patras. Masculine because it's followed by ha. Drop the genitive ending to get the stem pater. Before we get into this stem, a general note, we talked about ablot. We saw it in the first and second declension nouns in the dative singular. So where Logos, logu, logo. The logu to logo is an instance of oblot. Um, I'm going to quote uh, BBG, page 47, in 7.12. He said, logo, the omicron plus yoda goes to logo. Oblot is the technical term for this. By change their length, I mean that they can shorten omega to omicron, lengthen omicron to omega, as in the date of singular, or disappear entirely. So vowels change their length. Omicron can go to omega, short to long. Omega to omicron, long to short. Epsilon can go to eta, eta can go to epsilon. They can also have a zero form or drop out entirely. So actually, in pater, we're going to see some illustrations of oblot in zero, short, and long forms. So let's look at the paradigm here. Pater, patrasam. So nominative of pater, genitive patras. You memorize both those forms of the vocabulary, so that's going to be fine. But notice what's happened. You have pater. You have this long eta in the nominative, but that eta is gone in the genitive. It dropped out. You have a zero form. So the vowel went away when you have that normal ending os, pater, patros. In the dative, you have patri, and then in the accusative, patera. Now notice here the vowels come back, but it's a short vowel. Instead of a long eta, now you have a short vowel. You have an epsilon, patera. It's just oblot. In the plural, you have pateres, pateron, regular, but then you have patrasi, 
and a zero form. So the vowels dropped out between the tau and the rho. You don't have paterasi, just patrasi. You can't say the word without a vowel, so they added an alpha after the rho. You can't just say patra, patrasi. So they said patrasi. They added an alpha in. Why an alpha, not an epsilon? They just did. <laughs> no obvious reason. Probably Trump's fault, though. I mean, it must be. <laughs> Everything else is. So I mean, you can't blame Bush anymore. I mean, they were blaming him for a long time. All right. Um, so you have that. And in Mounts' morphology, he provides some conjectures, but don't, you don't really need to worry about it. So the data form is patrasi, zero form with no vowel between the tau and the rho, but an alpha added so you can pronounce it. And then the accusative, you have pateras, absolutely regular. So let's say these forms. Pater, patras, patri, patera, pateres, pateron, patrasi, pateras. Now you can look at this and say there's a lot of rules at work here. That is true. So you can decide, either be aware of the rules or just memorize the paradigm. If you want to just memorize, it's not that hard. Just remember that between the tau and the rho, there could be or not be a vowel and that vowel could be short or long. And the dative plural has its own interesting thing going on. If you remember that, then pater patrasa is pretty straightforward, shouldn't be that bad. It's a common word in the New Testament. After all, this is uh, the word used for the first person of the Godhead, the eternal father of his eternally begotten son, from who, as by one principle, the Holy Spirit proceeds eternally. So um, a good word here, pater patras. Um, just a few odds and ends, unusual things with it. And most of those things don't, again, don't really influence your ability to recognize it when you see it. When you see it, you know, you see pater. When I'm reading the New Testament, I see pater, singular, or I see pateras. I'm not thinking, boy, let me make sure all these rules. You just know that it's the word father. You see that, that ending on it. It's nominative singular, or, nom or it's the nominative form, or the nominative plural, or whatever, and you've got it. All right? But... That's the we should still give you the explanation. Any comments, questions on pater, patras? No? Okay. Last word here. Uh, hudor, hudatas ta, the Greek word for water. It's an important word because water is how your sins are... Oh, no. No, that's not true. Okay. Um, hudor, hudatas ta, um, the word water here. Water is important. It's common in the Bible. Now, you memorize it as hudor hudatas ta. You drop the genitive singular case ending to get hudat. Hudat. Right? <laughs> of water. So, um, that's probably something I would say. Because if I was in the water and didn't have my glasses on, I couldn't see anything. So, I say hudat. Because um, I can't tell. Now, how do we get from the stem hudat to the nominative form hudor? How did you go from alpha tau, hudat, to hudor with omega rho? If you really want to know why, look at Mounts' morphology book, but just memorize it. I mean, the nominative is hudor, genitive is hudatas, and dominatives do weird things. Just memorize it properly as hudor hudatas ta, and you'll be fine. After the genitive, it's, it's regular. So uh, you have hudati, dative singular, accusative singular, because it's neuter, it's the same as the nominative, so hudor. Plural, you have hudata. Uh, hudatone, hudasi, no tau because square stops, uh, tau drops off, so hudasi, and the accusative plural, hudata. So except for the hudor, this is perfectly regular. So let's say them together. Hudor, hudatas, hudati, hudor, hudata, hudatone, hudasi, hudata. All right, agathos. I think, yeah, um, on my chart here, there shouldn't be that accent on the Yoda and the Hudati. That's a mistake on that chart. It should be Hudati with no, um, no second accent on the word. So if you're wondering, why is there two accents? There shouldn't be two accents. I just made a mistake. Well, it's two accents even a legal thing. 
uh, when you have, good question, when you have those words like sue that drop the accent, yeah. then you can have two accents on the, on the word before, because the accent kind of goes the one before. But just on its own, a word isn't going to do this, no. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a, a typo. All right, so uh, we've learned, it. now, we've had these five different sub patterns of the third declension. And if you feel a little overwhelmed, the question you should need to ask yourself is, would I recognize this form? If I saw hudata, would I know what it was? Well, yes, you would. If you've memorized hudor hudatas ta, you know the stem is hudat, you see a form with alpha at the end, you know alpha has to be either nominative or accusative plural, so you're fine. If you go through these different words asking yourself, would I recognize these different words, knowing the nominative, the genitive, and hence the root and the gender. You know, if I memorize the word, the lexical form, will I know what they are? If the answer is no, then you need to decide what you're going to do with that particular word. If you see patrasi, would you recognize that as a dative plural of pater, patras, ha, or not? If you think that you would not recognize it, then make a separate vocabulary card for pater with all the forms and memorize the forms. If you think you would recognize it, then you can act accordingly. Then you can either just recognize it based on the rules or memorize it. So that's the key thing. Would you be able to recognize these words if you came across them? If you would, then you're good. So let's summarize. So we've learned about pronouns, words that refer back to nouns. We've learned about antecedents, the word that the pronoun refers back to. We've learned about personal pronouns, pronouns where the antecedent is personal. We've looked at the first person pronouns, English, I, me, my, we, are us, in Greek, ego, and hemes. We looked at the second person personal pronouns, you and your, or in early modern English, thou, thy, thee, and ye, your, you, and in Greek, su, and humes. We saw that in both English and Greek, the case is determined by function, and number and person are determined by the antecedent in both languages. We saw you, you're going to need to memorize the, first, the paradigms of the first and second person pronouns. Very common. It's just easier to memorize them. And then we looked at five different types of third declension stems. They had a few peculiarities, but nothing that should really cause you a lot of trouble. Most importantly, we saw that there was a consonantal yoda that used to exist in Greek in pistis type words. And pistis type words are always feminine. And yoda and epsilon will go back and forth in the forms, which may or may not be an issue for you. So let's go ahead and we'll read Mounce's summary here on 11.15. So let me get down to there. So a personal pronoun is a word replacing a personal noun. The English personal pronouns are I, me, I, my, me, we, are, us, first person, and you and your, second person. Case of a pronoun is determined by its function in the sentence, number and person by the antecedent. Most of the forms of the two pronouns are similar to the case endings you already know. Concentrate on those similarities. Pistis type words end in a consonantal yoda, which now appears as yoda or epsilon, and they are all feminine. And that's it for chapter 11. Praise God for that. Now we have, uh, so first and second personal pronouns, some third declension. Let's go on to the vocabulary for the chapter here. And I wanna, I'm going to point out a few things to the vocabulary too. So we have adolfos, adolfuha. So I'll say it uh, and then we'll say it together. So adolfos, adolfuha, brother or Adelfu, ha, huh? excuse me. Adelfos, Adelfu, ha, huh? brother. Now notice Mount says some Bible versions translate these, this use of Adelfos as brother or sister. It is true that some Bible versions do this. It's also true that some Bible versions are corrupting scripture here. Greek has a perfectly good word for sister. And if God had wanted to say brother or sister, he would have done it, just like he did in James 2.15. In James 2.15, he said, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, he said, e on de adolfos, e adolfei, gumnoi huparkosin, etc. 
So if God wants to say brother or sister, he'll put it right in there. But if you just see Adolphos on its own, it's brother. It's not brother or sister. Brother can, of course, include ladies, just like Adam, the fall of Adam, includes the whole human race. But we don't need to bow to feminism instead of biblical patriarchy, uh, which isn't abusing women. It's, it's God's glorious design, which is good for men and women. And don't do what the gender-neutral modern versions do and add or sister. Something else, too, and when God in Scripture employs he as the generic pronoun for the masculine singular, we should continue to do so as well. So in English grammar, someone, the he. Not, that's traditional grammar, it's biblical, biblically patriarchal. It's not someone, they. They is not the correct pronoun, it's he. We should do that, that's correct. Right, let's go to the next word here. On. On. Now, this is an untranslatable, uninflected particle, and it's used to make a definite statement contingent on something, like who to whoever, and you normally can't translate it. You'll see how it works when you see some examples. Aner, andros ha, man, male, husband. Aner, andros ha, man, male, husband. All right, so we have that word. Ecclesia, ecclesias, hey. Church, assembly, congregation. Ecclesia, ecclesias, hey. Church, assembly, congregation. Now, notice, of course, in Mounts gives the definition of the universal invisible church as the capital C church. A real church with real people, that's just a lowercase c church. While the universal invisible church, that is the capital C church with the uppercase c. Uh, the latter, the universal church, is not something you see in the New Testament anywhere. Uh, just look up all the instances of ecclesia, and you'll see that that is the case. Now, actually, I will point this out. Mounts doesn't specify whether the capital C church here, which doesn't exist in the New Testament, whether it's universal and visible, or whether it's universal or, and invisible. Whether the capital, if the capital C church is universal and visible, that's if you're a Roman Catholic, see? If it's universal and invisible, that's if you're a Protestant. And then if you're Baptist, it should be that every church is a capital C church. Not just the universal and visible one that only has invisible verses supporting it in the New Testament. Okay, let's go to elpis. Elpis, elpidos, hey, hope, expectation. Elpis, elpidos, hey, hope, expectation. And it is true that the large majority of the time, the word hope in the New Testament isn't something where you're just kind of doubting about it and you're not sure. It is a, a confidence. Uh, it is a, like a sure hope. There are a few times where elpis is used kind of in that more hope sense. But generally, it's that strong confidence, the Christian hope, which is a, not going to be ashamed. All right, keep going here. Exo, adverb without, preposition plus the genitive outside. Exo, adverb without, preposition plus the genitive outside. What kind of skeleton do ants have? An exoskeleton. What kind of skeleton do humans have? An endoskeleton, yeah. Unless you break a bone and it's sticking out, and that would be very painful. So yes, an exoskeleton, and exo means outside with the genitive. The human? If a human has an exoskeleton, then your health is definitely, there's a definite question about that. So epi plus the genitive on over when, epi plus the dative on the basis of at, epi plus the accusative on to against. Epi plus the genitive on over when, at P plus the dative on the basis of at, at P plus the accusative on to against. And he tells you that when at P has a word beginning with vowel and smooth breathing, the yoda elides, you have, so you have ep auton instead of at P auton. If the following word begins with a rough breathing, the yoda elides and the P becomes a phi. By aspiration, you have f humas. There's a lot, I, I would suggest with at P, either, you know, you definitely want to put either three flashcards with one plus the genitive, one plus the dative, one plus the accusative, or all in one flashcard, but you need to know it. I mean, the word appears 890 times. You're going to see a lot of FPs. 
So you want to know that. Hey, Mace, we. Hey, Mace, we. He puts it differently than ego, but I mean, I guess it's 864 times, so worth being aware of. Thelema, Thelematos ta, will desire. Thelema, Thelematos ta, will desire. Now, he mentions monothelitism it was a 7th century heresy that stated Jesus had, his footnote says that stated Jesus had only one nature and therefore only one will. That's actually not completely accurate. Um, you could have, you could be a duo diaphysite. Christ had two natures, but somehow only one will, which is weird, like a divine human will. So monothelitism is specifically the heresy Christ had one will, not that he had only one nature. Um, one nature is monophysitism. Uh, one, and Christ, of course, has two natures, a human nature and divine nature. So diophysitism and diothelitism, two natures, two wills are biblical. And actually, since we're talking about this one will heresy, uh, one of the strongest proofs against the infallibility of the Pope was a man named Pope Honorius. Pope Honorius was a Pope from 625 AD, October 27 to 638, and he was a monothelite. He thought that Christ had only one will. Um, and Roman Catholicism teaches that is a heresy. Uh, but this pope taught in his official letters to people, Sergius, Cyrus, and Sophronius, he taught ex cathedra, he taught in his official documents, the one will heresy. He said that we, he agreed with the uh, monothelite patriarch of Constantinople. He said, therefore, we confess one will of our Lord Jesus Christ. He viewed the will as an attribute of person and not of nature. So since Christ is one person, he said he must have only one will versus he has two natures, so not two, um, two wills. And so he did that. If you want to read Philip Schaff, actually has a good discussion of this in his uh, church history. So um, this is a problem because uh, even according to Roman Catholicism, monothelitism is a heresy. And furthermore, uh, this pope was condemned as a heretic by church councils for centuries. So in the Sixth Ecumenical Council, uh, he was called the Pope of, former Pope of Old Rome, who with the help of the old serpent had scattered deadly error. Deadly error. And he was anathematized by the Seventh Ecumenical Council of 787, by the Eighth Ecumenical Council of 869. And so... The councils are supposedly infallible, but they condemned him as a heretic for being a monothelite. And actually, for centuries, every new, the, the, every pope, newly elected pope, had a confession of faith, and the confession of faith condemned all these heretics, and they condemned Honorius as a heretic for centuries and centuries, even down to the 16th century. And so they just condemned him as a heretic, condemned him as a heretic, condemned him as a heretic. And so that was a um, big problem. So uh, the verdict of history then is that the whole uh, Roman church and the Eastern uh, Orthodox religion, for in their official count acts, their ecumenical councils, and their popes for hundreds of years believed that a Roman pope in his official teaching ex cathedra as a question of faith had erred. And so in 1870, when they decreed papal infallibility, this was actually a big problem, that the knowledgeable Roman Catholics knew that this was a big problem, that this pope had officially erred in his, in his dogmatic teaching and was condemned as a heretic by allegedly infallible councils for hundreds of years. So big problem for papal infallibility, monothelite pope, Pope Honorius. All right, let's go to the next vocab word here. Ida, see or behold. Ida. See, behold. It's kind of like, uh, this is the word used in, ta and this is Old Testament, like, behold, it was Leah. Um, ide, see, behold. Um, idu, also is see or behold. Idu, see, behold. Kalos, kale, kalon, beautiful or good. Kalos, kale, kalon, beautiful, good. Mater, matros he, mother. Mater, matros he, mother. Same declensional pattern as pater. 
Uda, and not, not even, neither, nor. Uda, and not, not even, neither, nor. Pater, patras, ha, father. Pater, patras, ha, father. Pistis, pista, os, hey, faith, belief. Pistis, pista, os, hey, faith, belief. Hudor, hudatas, ta, water. Hudor, hudatas, ta, water. Humace, you, or ye, plural. Humace, you, plural. Phos, photos, ta, light. Phos, photos, ta, light. Charis, caritas, te, grace, favor, kindness. Charis, caritas, te, grace, favor, kindness. Hoda, here. Hoda, here. And now you've got to 60.8% of the total word count of the New Testament. So praise God for that. We're going to go over some of the conversational stuff later, but let's take a little break at this point here. Yeah, when I said that hypostasis is used of the persons in the Trinity in Hebrews 1.3, that doesn't mean it's the only use. It's definitely used in other ways as well. I would commend to you those Greek songs. I've been singing at least one a day, and it helps to memorize those verses. And it actually also, you know, it's, there's a lot of truth in there, it impacts you, and you memorize those passages in Greek, and it's really, it's really good stuff. It only takes a short time. All right. Let's go to chapter 12. The exegetical insight for chapter 12 by I. Howard Marshall is fine. It is a blessing that the God of all grace does himself restore us there with one of the uses of autos, which we're going to be learning here. And so that is a great blessing. Great exegetical insight. I, Howard Marshall, is a heretic who corrupts the doctrine of inspiration, but he has a nice devotional thought here in 1 Peter 5.10. So, all right, uh, overview. I don't, I don't think I'm making myself popular like if the wider evangelical world wants to watch this class. <laughs> That's okay. Faithfulness is what matters, not popularity. All right, so chapter 12, 12 uh, the overview here. We're going to learn... Three different ways autos is used, and we're going to discover to our uh, happiness here that since autos is a 2 one 2 adjective, we already know all its forms. So that's good. Uh, this is a pretty easy chapter. So we're learning autos. Now we've seen autos before, meaning things like he, him, his, that sort of thing. Probably half of this chapter is review. It's an easy chapter, no new forms, pretty basic chapter on the word autos and how it functions. Okay, so 12.1, 12.2. In terms of English grammar, the only thing we need to be sure we know is that we're comfortable with a paradigm for the third personal personal pronoun English. So uh, the subjective singular is he or she or it. Possessive, his, her, or its. Objective, him, her, it. Subjective plural, they, possessive plural, their, objective plural, them. No. What is the difference between it's without an apostrophe and it's with an apostrophe? It's with an apostrophe. Good. That's right. It's with the apostrophe is it is. It's is the possessive pronoun, has no apostrophe. Good question, yeah. I'm sure you knew that you were just asking for the sake of the people in the video. That's good. Yeah, any other questions? All right. So uh, notice that he is subjective. You have his, him, all the other stuff there. No distinguishing between the genders and the plural. You just use they. In Greek, there is a distinction, which we're going to see shortly. So that's a third person personal pronoun in English. Let's move on to Greek. 12.3 through 12.6 here in BBG, forms of autos. These are forms that for the most part you already know. Autos is a 2-1-2 adjective, so it has second 
declension masculine, first declension feminine, second declension neuter endings, no problem. A couple things to notice. All forms begin with out, alpha, upsilon, smooth breath mark, tau. That may not seem like a big deal right now, but in the next chapter, there's a word that people can confuse with this word. And the way to keep them separate is to remember that autos begins with out, alpha, upsilon, smooth breathing, not rough breathing, and then tau. Okay? So we're going to see another word late next chapter, Lord willing, where it's different. So alpha, upsilon, tau, smooth breathing, that's good. The only form that might catch you here is the nominative and accusative singular neuter. So you have auta, no case ending. We are used to words like ergon that have a new at the end in the neuter. There, here there's no new at the end. This is one of the more common sub-patterns for the second declension neuter where there's no case ending. And you've actually seen this lack of a case ending ready with the article. Remember the article is ha, he, ta, not ha, he, ton with a new, right? Ha, he, ta. So out toss is part of that same sub-pattern as the article. Ha, he, ta, out toss, out te, out ta. All right? So no ending, no case ending in the nominative and accusative singular neuter. And so that means if you have an out ton with a new, there's only one thing it can be, and what would that be? Hint, it's on the board. Well, what? Well, look, if you have out ta, it could be either nominative or neuter, neuter. Let's say you do have an out ta and there is a new, what would it have to be? Good, it has to be masculine, accusative, singular, out ta. So it can't be neuter, because it has the new, the neuters don't have that new. See, that's why it's yellow. See yellow? Yellow is good. So, that makes life a little easier. Let's go ahead and say these forms. We'll say them across. Autos, aute, auta, autu, autes, autu, auto, aute, auto, auton, autain, auta, autoi, autai, auta, auton, autone, auton. Autois, autais, autois, autus, autas, auta. All right, good job. Let's talk about the uses of autos. 12.7, 12.8. We've got three basic uses for autos. By far the most common, and the first use, is as a third person personal pronoun. In fact, this is so much of the normal use that when you see the word autos in any of its forms, initially assume it's a third personal personal pronoun unless there's contextual evidence to indicate something to the contrary. So your default when you see autos is he, she, it, or they. And the most common use of autos is this one that you've seen for several chapters now. Autos, he, aute, she, auta, it. Out to his, out to taste her, out to its, and the rest of that paradigm there. To him, to her, to it, him, her, it, they, their, to them, them. So uh, consider the paradigm here. You can see that out toss, out to, out to, out on, going down the masculine column is he, his, to him, him. No problem here. Same thing in the feminine, she, her, to her, her and so on. Now when you get to the plural, notice that in Greek you do distinguish gender for the masculine, feminine, neuter, unlike in English. In English we just have they, it's not distinguished by gender, while it is distinguished by gender for the plurals in Greek. So pretty much all you need to realize is this fact, because no matter whether in Greek it's autoi or autai or auta, in English, you're going to say they. Whether it's autus, autos, or auta, you're going to say them. Whether it's a bunch of men, a bunch of women, a bunch of things, mixed group, you're going to say, say they, they are to them, or them, right, in the plural. So that's this use of autos. 
what determines its form? How do we know which form to use? It's pretty much a matter of common sense. What determines the case of our toss is what determines the case of any pronoun. It's function. So if our toss is functioning as a subject, it will be in what case? Not it. If it's functioning as the direct object, what case will it be in? Accusative, yeah, just like that. And just like in the last chapter with ego and sue, when our toss is functioning as a possessive, it's going to be in the genitive, it will immediately follow the word it modifies, and it will be an arthrus. So if you want to say his name, you'd say ta'anama autu, the name of him. And that's pretty straightforward. What determines the gender and number of autos when it's functioning as a personal pronoun? Again, common sense here, the number is determined by the antecedent, the grammatical antecedent. Is it referring back to one thing or more than one? How about the gender? Gender of autos. Most part common sense here as well, although we need to break it into two parts because of one unusual thing. If the antecedent of autos is personal, a man, a woman, um, a person of the Godhead, then it, you translate out toss as following natural gender. You know, him for the man, her for the woman. If the antecedent, so for example, the Greek word sinner, hamartolos, is masculine gender. So if you have the form of out toss referring back to the word sinner, it's going to be masculine grammatically and would re, we would refer generics of this sort as he in English. So sinner, he, sinners, they, uh, Greek would be hamartolos with autos in whatever case. All right? Except in the plural, of course, they, there's no differentiation of gender. The oddity with autos is if the antecedent is not personal and the antecedent is singular. In the plural, there's no problem for translation because... You just translate all the plurals as they, and you're fine. Gender is not distinguished. If the antecedent is singular and not personal, then this is also actually pretty much common sense too, but you translate in accordance with the uh, grammatical gender of the word. So if our toss is referring back to the feminine antecedent, hamartia, sin. Sin is uh, hamarto loss, the ma is a masculine sinner, hamartia, that's the feminine word sin. If our toss is referring to the feminine word hamartia, then it'll have the feminine form aute, because its antecedent is grammatically feminine, so aute. Now, even though, we, but in English, we don't refer to sin as a she, we refer to sin as an it. So we would translate the aute, even though it's feminine, we translate it with the neuter it, even though there's a feminine form in the Greek text, aute. If the antecedent were the noun cosmos, world, Cosmos is masculine, so you'd have the masculine form of autos in the Greek text. Even though we don't refer in English to the world as a he, we refer to the world as an it. So we would translate the autos as it, even though in the Greek text it has a masculine form, you know, he, as it were, not the neuter. So the oddity here is when grammatical and natural gender don't line up, then you have to go in your translation with the appropriate thing in English. So in Greek, you know, the Greek gender will always match the grammatical gender of the antecedent, but in English, when it's not a person, you have to consider this grammatical gender thing. I don't think that's that complicated. Does that make sense? It's not, but my question is, for example, when we do use gender in English, we use it in Okay, question is, what do you do if there's like an impersonal thing and it's kind of personified, sort of? Yeah, it's like, it's my country, tis of thee, and you have like the Statue of Liberty in your head or something. Okay. Well, it's common that, for example, the land of Israel is identified as she or a nation as yeah. she or something like that. A woman, yeah, sometimes you know, have Israel personified as a woman. If you have personification, then I think yeah, you have to consider, you, you would take that into consideration. Maybe then you would translate the Greek pronoun with what it actually is grammatically. Earth, gay. 
Um, I would probably, earth, I think you're probably fine just leaving as an it, just because in English we you know, typically refer to it as an it. I, yeah, there might be some of those special cases where you might have to think about it, but at least in general, you know, just think about, put the, put the appropriate English pronoun in and just remember that here, you're not violating some kind of terms of literalism if you um, don't translate the pronoun aute as she when it refers to an antecedent. If you translate it, it's, it's okay. It's fine. So, um, that's pretty much common sense. You don't need to be overly worried about it. I don't think most students have a problem trying to figure that out. I will point this out. Well, I will point out when the New World so-called translation of the Watchtower Society, when they decide to follow grammatical gender, they argue against the Holy Spirit being a person because pneuma is neuter in Greek, uh, even though all the ma words are neuter in Greek. And they actually make this as an argument. So, for example, did I put the quote in? No, I didn't. Okay. So, for example, in the Watchtower uh, for 415-1961, they say about the Holy Spirit, the Greek word for spirit is itself neuter in gender and is properly referred to, therefore, by the neuter pronoun in English because it does not have personality. So they say, pneuma is neuter, therefore you should make the Holy Spirit an it in English and depersonalize him. That's preying on the ignorance of people about the distinction in Greek between grammatical and natural gender. And they're not very consistent with it either. So for example, in Matthew 2.13, which I have on the board here, Herodes zetain ta paideon to apolesai auta. Herod will seek the young child, speaking about the Lord Jesus, to destroy him. Auta, that prone, so ta paideon, what's the gender of paideon there with that ta? Remember the article is your friend, ta paideon, neuter. Paideon is neuter, okay. And so it has the neuter pronoun auta. But we don't translate Herod will see the young child to destroy it. King James doesn't do that. And oh, look at this. For the Lord Jesus, the New World Translation doesn't say, well, Paideon is neuter. So it doesn't say Herod is about to search for the young child to destroy it. It doesn't say it. It says him. So the New World Translation doesn't have a problem with translating a neuter pronoun as him. Just for the Holy Spirit, then they make this argument about it being neuter, the word pneuma being neuter, and so we're going to make the Holy Spirit an it every single time. Would you be able to put that reference in the slide? That way I can like, go back to it and get that? For the, uh, um, yeah. No, we're putting all of these in. Yeah. I, I'm, I mean, for the, um, 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 the one you had before that you said you didn't have in there, what you said. Oh, the quote from the Watchtower? Yeah. I might. I'll, I'll, I'll say it a second time. Um, I might put it back in. It depends how much time we have to do it. This is what, but this is what they said. They said, uh, the Greek word for spirit is in itself neuter in gender and is properly referred to, therefore, you know what, what this is what I'll do, since you asked. I'll, I'll, put my, put it, I'll put it up at least from my notes on here. Let's see. There we are. So here's the quote. They said, the Greek word for spirit is itself neuter in gender and is properly referred to, therefore, by the neuter pronoun in English because it does not have personality. Preying on people's ignorance of the distinction between grammatical and natural gender, even though they don't practice that when they talk about Christ. Christ can have a neuter word refer to him, and they still translate the pronoun as him, not as it. So, but... How many Watchtower people are going to know that? Practically none of them. Well, probably not even the translators. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not even the translators. That's a good point, yeah. The New World translators probably didn't know. At least the majority of the committee didn't know Greek, and it's almost certain the whole committee didn't know Hebrew. I'm not even talking about Aramaic. So I don't know what they did, but they probably just looked at like English translations, just put whatever they want in, but they did not know. The, there was only one of the translators that had ever taken any classes in New Testament Greek in his life. One translator. And I think he had two credit hours in New Testament Greek. And he'd studied some classical Greek too, so I'll give him that. But the rest of the translation committee had never taken a class in Greek in his life. Yeah, and none of them had ever taken a class in Hebrew. So how well do you think that would work to translate if you'd never taken a class in Hebrew? Agathos. You think it would work Agathos? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it would be Agathos. I think it would be uh, uh, 
Kakas. <laughs> yeah, not very good. That's why they keep the names of the translators secret. They want to, to keep that information under wraps. They say it's because of modesty, but Paul put his name on his letters and he was modest. So it's not modesty. It's, it's, they're trying to cover it up. So anyway, worth mentioning that. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah, shame and embarrassment. So, in English, we're going to follow natural gender in English when translating autos, even though the word in Greek follows grammatical gender. Okay, Ooh, back here. So, um, that's the first and most common use of autos, third personal person pronoun, and pretty much common sense, not too bad. Let's go on to 12.9 and 12.10 here. We have the second use of autos as an adjectival intensive. So let's say you came across, you're reading the New Testament, and you came across the phrase ha David autos. David, he, that doesn't make any sense. This is one of the biggest clues that autos is not functioning as a personal pronoun. If it doesn't, if the sentence doesn't make sense with autos as a personal pronoun, then it's not a personal pronoun. Okay. So you can default to autos as a personal pronoun, but if it doesn't make sense as that, then it has to be something else. All right? So what do you do with ha, dawid, autos? This would be the adjectival intensive use of autos. Now, Mounts notes that this is not standard terminology, but it's the terminology Accordance uses, so he adopts it. Mounts is now the most commonly used Greek grammar, and Accordance is the best Bible software, so hey, we're going to use this usem. So, you would translate our toss in this situation with an English reflexive pronoun, David himself. Mount says that this translation in English is a little more emphatic than the Greek actually is, and points out that Greek does have its own reflexive pronoun. But this is the way we are representing in English that this word, that the Holy Spirit dictated this word of the Greek New Testament. And it's didactically valuable for you to know that autos is there and needs to be translated. So you translate this use of autos as David himself, the book itself, Mary herself, something like that, with this kind of uh, intensifying, adject, uh, intensifying word. All right. But even though you can keep in mind that that may be a little bit more emphatic in English than it might be in, in Greek. But you still translate it that way, so you represent the word in English with something. And that's actually the same sort of, this is the same sort of situation that you have with the nominative forms of ego and su. If you have a verb, you know, I, I write, okay, that the I is implied in the verb itself, okay, so you don't, if you express ego, with the verb write, graphe, ego graphe, versus just graphe, it's going to be a little more emphatic because you're making a decision to stick an extra word in when you didn't need to. And so we haven't discussed the verbs very much yet, but the person is expressed in the verb form itself. So lego, for example, on its own means I say. So the Greek speaker says ego lego, like Christ does in Matthew 21, 27. The addition of the explicit ego is I say, or I myself say. Same thing goes with su plus a verb. Uh, maybe the verb would say, would on its own would be you say, or thou saidst. Well, you add the su and it's you say, or you yourself say. So that autos is kind of not necessary here in this adjectival intensive use, but it's giving it a bit more oompa, okay? Adding a little bit of force to it, a little bit of intensity, right? So how do you identify so the examples here, ha Jesus autos, Jesus himself, ha cosmos autos, the world itself, autehe ecclesia, the church itself or herself. Su autos leges, you yourself say. Yeah, yeah, because church is often is a woman, right? Yeah. Church is the bride. How can you identify the adjectival intensive use of autos? Number of clues. One, the autos does not make sense as a personal pronoun. That's your first clue, important clue, but we've got a few more. Two, the autos will be modifying something. When it's used as a personal pronoun, 
it doesn't modify anything as a function. It stands on its own, right? Him on its own. If it's adjectival intensive, it'll be modifying some substantive. In this usage, the case number and gender of the autos will be determined by the word it's modifying. So with ha da wit autos, David is nominative singular masculine, and thus uh, autos will likewise be nominative singular masculine. So the autos is modifying David, ha da wit autos, and they're going to match in their uh, gender, their case and their number. Third clue, and this is usually the biggest clue. When autos is functioning as an adjectival intensive, in almost every case, it will be modifying the subject of the sentence when it's being used intensively. So normally what you'll have is an express subject, David, Jesus, world, church, and then the word autos. That's your main clue. Ha Jesus autos. Ha cosmos autos. Ha David autos. And then the fourth clue or su autos, you yourself say. The fourth clue is the autos will be in the predicate position. It's ha David autos, their second predicate position. The noun David has the article, and the modifier autos does not. Say, so I forgot the adjective and predic adjectival predic attributive and predicate positions. Well, here they are. To remind you, chart here, you have the first, second, and third attributive positions, first and second predicate positions, and so Predicate positions is adjective, article, noun. Agathos, ha anthropos, the man is good. Or article, noun, adjective, ha agathos, ha anthropos, agathos, the man is good. And this chart isn't in BBG. This is actually from Wallace, but it's useful stuff. And then the attributive, ha agathos, anthropos, the good man. Ha anthropos, ha agathos, the good man. So in the attributive positions, remember you've got the article in front of the adjective. While well, in the predicate positions, there's no article in front of the adjective. So with the adjectival intensive use of autos, it's in the predicate position. The autos does not have an article in front of it. And so that's another clue. But the main clue, as we already noted, is that in almost every case, the autos will be in the nominative, modifying the subject of the sentence. It doesn't make sense as a personal pronoun, and it will normally be in the, and it will be, not just normally, it will be in the predicate position. So a few examples that should make this clear. The exegetical insight for BBG chapter 12 already discussed, that use of autos that, that was discussed in the exegetical insight was the adjectival intensive use. So, he already discussed that in the, in the external insight already, so you can look back at that, see that. But now that we've gone over it, you can go back and understand a little more. So here we have some four examples of adjectival intensive use. First one, ha Jesus, autos. Here, obviously, the autos is intensive. Can't be a personal pronoun, don't make any sense. So this phrase is Jesus himself. Ha cosmos autos. Autos here is masculine. Why is autos masculine with cosmos? Yes. Cosmos is masculine, right? So, but we don't refer to the world as in English as a he. We would say the world itself. Said so the word him, world himself, even though autos is masculine. So in English, we have to follow that natural gender. In Greek, we're following grammatical gender. So the world without toss is masculine. But in English, we'd say the world itself. Now, if you had aute he ecclesia, normally the autos does come after the word, but sometimes it can come before. Here's an example where it comes before. If you had autos he ecclesia, how would you translate that? Well, grammatically, ecclesia is feminine. So aute is feminine. That's why you have an aute versus some other form. And we would say the church itself. Unless there was some maybe allusion to the church as Christ's bride, and then we would say the church herself, but that would be something dictated by the context, not something required by the transfer of Greek grammatical gender into English natural gender. Here's the final one. Su autos leges. 
what would you do here? So you can see the subject, the autos is modifying, does not need to be third person. So that's interesting, right? Jesus is third person, Cosmos is third person, XXC is third person, Sue is second person. So here are the autos, the third, that, which is used as a third person pronoun in this usage, the adjectival intensive usage, is actually modifying a second person pronoun, Sue. So that may look a little strange, but grammatically we can understand it. Thou toss is an adjectival intensive, modifying the sue. The sue is the subject of leges, you say. So this would you translate as you yourself say, or thou thyself saidst. You yourself say. All right? So we can see from this final example that our toss in this usage does not need to modify only a third personal third person word. They can modify first person or second person too. On page 103, BBG says something here. Uh, let's see, where is it? Middle, middle page somewhere, I think. Different. 103. Yeah, middle of 1210. Different suggestions are made on how to translate out toss when it occurs in this situation. He says, uh, some suggest using a reflexive pronoun as in the illustrations above. David himself spoke, Jesus himself. Uh, it is David himself and not someone else who spoke by the Holy Spirit. In autos, David, apen, ento, numati, tohagio, Jesus, autos, uk, baptism. Right. Then below there he says, others suggest ignoring the personal intensive use of autos in the nominative because the translation is not sound proper in English ears. If you do ignore it, be sure to remember that it adds an intensifying force. So we should, you, I would recommend that you do translate it the way you've been discussing it. Do not leave it untranslated. So do not follow the others suggest. Follow the example that Mounts gives and what we've been talking about. Translate it. God put the word in there. We want to represent it with something in English. So David himself says, Jesus himself says, stuff like that. So that's the adjectival intensive use of autos. Comments, questions about that? Is that always in the nominative? Is it always in the nominative? Well, what was the third clue? <laughs> you remember the third clue. This is the biggest clue. Third clue. Does he put the clues specifically in there? The third clue, which is the biggest clue, is that when our toss is functioning as an adjectival intensive, in almost every case, it will be modifying the subject of the sentence when it's being used intensively. So almost all the time, yes, it will be modifying the subject, and therefore it will be nominative. Now, we did say almost. So maybe not all. But almost every time, yes, this, it will be what you said there. Almost every time. Oh, that's what he says right in 1210. When functioning is the intensive, our toss is usually in the nominative case and modifies the subject. So yeah, so there's, there's the answer for you. And he tells you the subject doesn't need to be third person. That example, sue our toss legase, there 1210. That's good. Okay, 12.11, identical adjective. Third use of autos, and this is the least frequent usage by far, is as an identical adjective. So let's say you're reading along, you came across ton, auton, logon. How would you translate that? Well, it can't be the he word, right? Now, if you had ton out ton anthropon, maybe it would be the he man. He man. So, um, that probably would be like, I don't even, they probably couldn't even show that cartoon today because it's probably too politically incorrect. <laughs> yeah. He man's a biblical name. He man? Oh, yeah, you're right, it is. Yeah, yeah, wow. That's right, I have it underlined. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Wow, okay. 
<laughs> yeah, so, but we're not, no, that's not the, the identical adjective is different. So, ta now ta log, and you're not going to translate that as the he word or the it word. It can't be adjectival intensive because the auton is articular. And remember, in the adjectival intensive, it's in the predicate position, which means it doesn't have the article. So, it can't be predicate, can't be adjectival intensive, can't be just a third person pronoun. So, it has to be the identical adjective, which is the third use. And you translate that as ton out ton log and is the same word, the same word. To identify the identical use of autos is pretty straightforward. First, it's not going to be seen that often. Second, it will be in the attributive position. It will be immediately preceded by the article. Remember, all the attributive positions have the article right in front of them, but not the predicate. That's your main clue. Main clue is attributive position. And when our toss is functioning in this way, it will agree with a case, number, and gender of the word it's modifying. So here, log on is accusative singular um, masculine, and so our ton is masculine accusative singular. And so ton our ton log on is the same word. That's the identical adjective. Attributive position translated the same. And you can actually have it too. He gives the example of um, an aute te hora there. That's in the same hour. That's still attributive position. Aute is still attributive position. It's still modifying hora, agrees with it. But there, that one is a second attributive position. It's like, if we go back to the chart here, it's like ha anthropos, ha agathos, the good man. Well, the first one, the ton out ton log on, is like ha agathos anthropos, the first attributive. So it can be, it doesn't have to be first attributive. It could be first attributive, ton out ton log on, same, the same word. Or it could be second attributive, and out te te hora, the same hour, in the same hour. Um, but it's still attributive position, still agrees with the other word. Questions on the identical adjective? All right. So, summary, what have we learned in this chapter? We've learned that autos is a normal 2-1-2 word. The only oddity is in the nominative and accusative neuter singular, where there's no case ending used. We have auta instead of auton, which means that when you do have auton, it must be accusative singular masculine. It must be over here versus being up there. So, we saw that. And then we saw that our toss has three basic functions. By far the most common is as a personal pronoun, something we've been seeing for several chapters now. When our toss is functioning as a personal pronoun, we see that the case is determined by function and the number and gender are determined by the antecedent. The only thing to watch out for is when the antecedent is singular and not personal. In such a situation, you have to translate with proper English and follow natural gender in your translation, even though the Greek sentence will follow grammatical gender. We also saw that autos can function as an adjectival intensive, in which case uh, you will translate it with an English reflexive, so as himself, herself, or itself, or yourself, themselves. Normally, when autos is an adjectival intensive, it will be modifying the subject, and so it will be in the nominative, and it will be in the predicate position. And thirdly, autos can sometimes function as an identical adjective, in which case it means the same, and it will be in the attributive position. So if you look on page 104 of Mounts, we'll read his summary there on page 104. So, our toss uses the normal case endings except for the nominative and accusative neuter singular, which drop the new. This is a common variation. When our toss functions as a pronoun, its case is determined by function, its number and gender by antecedent. When our toss adds emphasis, it is usually translated with a reflexive pronoun. It usually will be in the predicate position in the nominative case. Our toss can function as the identical adjective and be translated same. In this usage, it normally is in the attributive 
position. So a pretty short chapter there. I think you'll be able to get through the exercises without that much difficulty. Let's go on to the vocabulary here. So I'll read it and you can read it after me. Ion, Ionos ha, age, eternity. Ion, Ionos ha, age, eternity. Note there he says the idioms ace ton Iona and ace tus Ionos ton Ionon both mean forever. Well, the King James properly translates ace ton Iona as forever. And actually, in the King James, it has them as two words because it's like the ace is the four and the ton Iona is the ever. So forever. That's how long. For how long? Forever. And then the ace tus Ionos ton Ionon would be forever and ever. So when you see forever and ever, you stick that extra and ever on there, that's ace tus Ionos ton Ionon. When you just have forever, it's ace ton Iona. All right? Now, if this is an important phrase for dealing with annihilationism. If you have annihilationists, so for example, Revelation 20 verse 12 says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So here you have um, the devil and the antichrist, the beast, who is a human being, and the false prophet, who is a human being, and these two human beings are explicitly said to be tormented day and night, ace tu sionos ton ionon, into the ages of ages, forever and ever. So if you're an annihilationist, what do you do with this verse? If you say nobody gets tormented forever and ever, you just cease to exist. And this actually says day and night, forever and ever. I have an answer for you on that. Give me a second. You have an answer? What, ignore it? <laughs> yeah, you use the New World Translation. That's, you know, I don't know what the New World Translation translates this as. Do you do the same thing they did with Acts 8.37? You just get rid of it? You get rid of it? <laughs> just Typically, actually, no. A, a very common annihilationist tactic would be just ignore it. Say, what about this verse? And just kind of steer the conversation somewhere else. That's definitely something they do. Now, if they're pinned down to it, what they say typically is... Forever and ever only means as long as they exist. So they get burned up and they cease to exist. And they're not tormented day and night forever and ever, even though the text says they're tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, their justification for this is there's one Hebrew phrase translated forever that doesn't always designate a literal eternity. So there is a particular Hebrew phrase that doesn't always have to mean, it sometimes can mean literal eternity, but doesn't always have to. And so they take that fact and that is a fact. Like it talks about when they, you bore the servants through his ear through with an awl, and it says it'll be his master's slave forever. Well, he obviously is going to be a slave in you know, the New Jerusalem, right? <laughs> okay. So that particular Hebrew phrase can, but does not have to mean literal eternity. So they take that, and then they just assume that's true for a completely different language, Greek, and you can just make it any phrase you want. So you can make forever and ever, day and night, just mean not what it means because of something in a different language, in a different phrase. So that's one thing they do. That's very poor exegesis, but that's what they do. So you simply have to reject the plain meaning of the verse. All right? And if you do a word study, if you use accordance, and you do a word study of ace tu sionos ton ionon, every time you have the phrase in the New Testament, it's always literal, literal eternity. It's never something less than that in the New Testament, never, ever. So you can't just say, I just want this to mean less than literal eternity, so I'm just going to make it that. All right? So this is very difficult for them to get out of. Ionos ton Ionon forever and ever. You can't get out of that being literal eternity. It never is something less than that. It's a problem if you're a, um, an annihilationist. So some of them just say, well, forever and ever just means as long as you exist when it doesn't. Now there's one other, I guess, interesting, if you can call rejecting the Bible interesting. Um, one other way that certain groups of annihilationists try to get out of it. So the United Church of God cult, they have a pamphlet called What Happens After Death? And they say that in Revelation 20.10, now notice the word R is italicized. What does an italicized word in the King James mean? It's not there in the Greek. It's not there in the Greek, okay? 
So now, well, first, let's show why this is so powerful just by the natural reading here. So if you, we're not going to read through all of Revelation 19 and 20. But basically what happens is, is Christ comes back in Revelation 19, okay? Christ comes back, and then you have, um, so he comes back, and then you have the beast and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire, right, when he comes back, okay? They're cast alive in the lake of fire, burning the brimstone. Then you have a thousand, everybody else is slain. And then you have a thousand-year reign of Christ. The devil is put in the bottomless pit. Christ rules for a thousand years. After the thousand years, there's the final rebellion. Christ wins. And the devil is put into the lake of fire now, where the beast and the false prophet are. Ooh, so they're still there a thousand years after they're put in. So if they're getting annihilated. It's taking a really long time because they're still there a thousand years later. This is a big problem. They're not annihilated, okay? They're still there a thousand years later. Then you have the judgment of all the unsaved dead, and all the unsaved dead are put into the same lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. So all the unsaved get the same eternal torment, day and night, forever and ever, that the beast and the false prophet get. They just got a thousand years more of it. All right? So this is not annihilation, okay? Totally not annihilation with context. So what do you do with this? You can ignore it. But the Church of God cult, what they do, is they point out that in Revelation 20.10, Notice the word R is italicized, right? So they say, oh, see, it's italicized. So it shouldn't say R. What it should say is it should say we're placed. So they say, this is with their own words. They say, the devil who deceived them was, ca was cast in the lake of fire where the beast and the Paul prophet are, or were cast, as many acknowledge this should be rendered and will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Does this verse say that these two end-time individuals, the beast and the false prophet, will be tormented for eternity? The beast and the false prophet are human beings. While still alive, they will be cast into the lake of fire. We see from Malachi 4.1-3 and Mark 9.47-48 that any human being thrown into the lake of fire will be destroyed. He will perish. He will not be tormented for eternity. Revelation 20.10 is speaking of the devil being cast in the lake of fire at the end of Christ's 1,000-year reign. Reference to the beast and false prophet being cast in its only parenthetical. That will, they will have died a thousand years earlier. They will not still be burning there. Thus being tormented forever and ever applies principally to Satan and presumably his demonic cohorts as well. So they say, well, the devil will be tormented day and night forever and ever, but nobody else. And this shouldn't say the beast and the false prophet are there. It should say they were placed there, but they're not there anymore. So what do you think of that? Think it's stupid? <laughs> yeah. It is stupid, but there's, it simply isn't what the text says. Now, there is no explicit word R, but here's the verb shall be tormented. Look at the bottom there in accordance. Is that verb singular or plural? Plural, ooh, plural verb. So shall be tormented is not just the devil. There's a plurality here. So the beast and the false prophet are still there. The R isn't just the King James is biased. It has to be are, not were placed. Because it's not just the devil shall be tormented day and night. It's they, plural, will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the beast and the false prophet are still there a thousand years later by the fact that there's a plural verb here. They will be tormented. Not he will be tormented day and night. So you can't get out of the verse the way that they say. It doesn't work. It simply doesn't mean it. So this is the end of annihilationism. And by the way, when they say that the lost perish... And that means they get annihilated. Perish doesn't, that is not, doesn't prove perish. So for example, in Matthew 9, 17, they put the new wine in the old bottles, and the bottles perish. Did the bottles get annihilated? Yes. No, they didn't. Yeah. Yes. No, they were still there. They were just ruined. Yeah, they didn't. You put the new wine, poof, bottles gone, right? <laughs> it's still there. It just gets messed up, right? So... Perish doesn't have to mean cease to exist. It can mean ruin without remedy. And if you're in hell, if you're in the lake of fire, you're ruined without remedy. You perish. It doesn't mean you cease to exist. Annihilation would probably be wonderful at that point. It would be wonderful at that point. Sure, you're, you're right, it would be. Um, and exodus and destruction, destroy doesn't mean cease to exist. It can mean ruin with beyond repair. 
like in the um, Exodus 10.7, Egypt is destroyed after the plagues. Egypt did not cease to exist. All right? Uh, in the LXX, for example, it's Apollyon, the, uh, Apol, Apollolen, which is, you know, destroy. And they translate it as lion ruins. So neither destroy nor perish require annihilation. There's no mileage for annihilationism from those words. And so when you have something like Revelation 20.10, you simply can't get out of it, and it means shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so this shows this is a very serious thing, very sober reality, rejecting Christ is, is very bad, and um, how imperative it is to show love to people and give them the gospel, and how great love the Lord, the God showed in having a son bear that full torment that every sinner in hell deserves on the cross. Christ suffered more on the cross to keep a sinner from hell than he will ever suffer. He'll have to get to the end of eternity to suffer as much as Christ suffered to keep him out of there. Um, so, I thought that was worth mentioning. Ace tu sionas toneonum. There's other texts too. Destruction doesn't mean annihilation. It never means annihilation in the New Testament. Um, so, I give you a lot of references. It, 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 everything from the New Testament, Josephus, to, um, to everything. So, anyway. Um, Back to the vocabulary. Next word here. We have uh, didoskalos. Didoskalos, didoskalu ha, teacher. Didoskalos, didoskalu ha, teacher. Euthus, immediately. Euthus, immediately. So if you say, heos pur, behold fire, then you say immediately, and you tell people to get out, right? Heos. Conjunction until, preposition plus the genitive as far as. Heos, until, preposition plus the genitive as far as. Mathe tes, mathe tu ha, disciple. Mathe tes, mathe tu ha, disciple. Uh, and by the way, the word disciple means is a learner, down at the bottom there. The word disciple is not used as like a special subcategory of super Christians. Like for example, the, the New Testament says the disciples forsook Christ and fled. They weren't being super Christians at that point. <laughs> but they're still called disciples. Um, so certainly we can grow in our discipleship, and that's very important, and we should. But the New Testament employs the word disciple for every Christian. Like in Acts 11, 26, the disciples are first called Christians in Antioch. There, the category Christian and disciple are actually exactly identical in the Greek text. So they're, they're equivalent categories. So in other words, it's not a bigger category of Christian, a smaller category of disciple, but they're identical categories. So you'd have to say only some, Christ, so only some believers are Christians if you want to say only some believers are disciples. Not, again, that we can't grow. We, we, we should definitely grow in our discipleship, and that's very important. And um, by all means, let's, let's do that. All right. Um, men, euthus, heos, mathetes, mathetuha. Men, on the one hand, indeed. Men, on the one hand, indeed. This is a post-positive word. It, in other words, it doesn't occur in the first word of sentence. Sometimes it's untranslatable. It can occur with de. When you have men and then you have de, it's like on the one hand, but on the other hand. It's something like that. These contrastive clauses. Okay. Me deis, me de mia, me den. No one, nothing. Me deis, me de mia, me den. No one, nothing. And he says it declines just like udes, which we're going to... Um, no, I think we learned udes last chapter, yeah. Monos, mane, monon, alone only. Monos, mane, monon, alone only. Monotheism, of course, only one God. Hopos, how, that, in order that. Hopos, how, that, in order that. Hasos, hase, hasan. As great as, as many as. Hasos, hase, hasan. As great as, as many as. He says there the initial hos retains the same form, but the second half of the word declines like the relative pronoun. So, in other words, it's just like the, the pronoun hos, he, ha, tu, taste, tu. Okay? Um, Hot, wait, yeah. ha, say, ha. It, it's hos hey ha, okay? And then you just stick the, that initial stuff at the end, at the beginning. Stick it at the end. So uh, it's just like the relative pronoun, hos, all right? 
you, you parse it the same way. What? I have, a, I have a friend, his name is Hassan. Hassan? Um, he, was a, he was a debater. Um, he won state two years in a row. Oh, um, wow. When I was a junior, in, no, yeah, when I was a sophomore and junior. Um, so he was a great debater, so I have a great ass, Hassan. Oh, good. Great, Hassan. Amen. All right, Hassas, Hasse, Hassan. Um, un, therefore, then, accordingly. Un, therefore, then, accordingly. Ophthalmos, ophthalmuha, I, sight. Ophthalmos, ophthalmuha, I, sight. Of course, an ophthalmologist is the eye doctor, right? Pollen, again. Pollen, again. He mentions there, this is kind of weird, in his footnote, he says, the Paulan Genesea is the rebirth both of the Christian, Titus 3.5, and of the world in Stoic thought. I don't really know why he said in Stoic thought. Let's study, let's, see, let's say we wanted to study the word Paulan Genesea, regeneration, in Titus 3.5. So here's Titus 3.5. Not Boris Rice, we have done, but according to Boris Rice, but washing of regeneration. So here's Paul and Genesea, regeneration. Oh, it's used in Matthew, not just in Stoic thought. Look at that. So let's study the word out. It is in two uses Matthew 19 28 and Titus 3 5. Washing of regeneration is when a person is regenerated. Here we have the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. Here, this is the world being regenerated. So instead of Stoic thought, he could have said Matthew 19, 28. <laughs> All right. Now, actually, the, new he the, the millennial kingdom, where there's a regeneration of the world, teaches us a lot about what personal regeneration is like. All right. The millennial regeneration is a dramatic and visible change that affects every part of the world. Right. It's not like you'll, if you were in the millennium, you saw this lion with a lamb, you would kind of know that something has changed. Right. This is a different place around here, all right? So the, and personal regeneration is likewise a dramatic and visible change. It results, there's going to be evidence. Uh, so the idea that personal regeneration can fail to show up in somebody's life is as foolish as to say that in the millennial kingdom, you won't be able to tell that it's not, you know, the red light district anymore, <laughs> okay? It's going to show up, all right? And in both personal and millennial regeneration, Christ is Lord. Jesus is ruling the millennial world. Jesus also rules you when you're regenerate. It's not a post-conversion decision that you finally decide that Jesus is going to rule you now. He rules you from the time that you become regenerate. He's on the throne. Uh, and so, there's nevertheless, though, sin is still present in the millennium, isn't it? There's going to be a final rebellion at the end. And in the regenerate Christian, there's still, sin is still present too. <laughs> Okay, it's not in charge anymore. Just like in the millennium, sin is not in charge, but sin is still present. So you can learn a lot. And by the way, sin isn't just present in a part of the Christian, like only in his soul or something like that, but he has a sinless spirit. That's not <laughs> biblical. Sin affects every part of the Christian, even though it's not in charge. Just like in the millennium, uh, regeneration affects the whole person. In personal and the regeneration of the world affects the whole person, but still is still present, in every, even though it's not in charge. So a lot we can learn about what regeneration is personally, polygenesia for a person, from the polygenesia of the world. And if Stoics did it that way too, I guess that's nice, but Matthew 19, 28 is more important. So pollen, again. All right. Pus padasha, foot. Pus padasha, foot. And he sent, mentions that it's declined like elpis, hope. Except you have um, omicron going to ooh. Huper, plus the genitive in behalf of. Huper, plus accusative above. Huper, plus the genitive in behalf of. Huper, plus the accusative above. And of course, hyper is excessive or abundance. Hyperbole, exaggeration for effect. All right. So those are those words. I want to go over the conversational stuff, and we have those workbook exercises. But just because of the time right now, I want to quickly, since we're doing the vocab for 11 and 12, Let's go over the vocab for 800 words and images, pages 6 to 19. 
and then we'll have to stop for a day and we'll do the other stuff next time. So I'm going to put that up. If you want to get your book out, here is the vocabulary. You can either, it's your book so you can mark it if you want. I mean, I think it's good to write in books. I like these pictures. I think they help you learn. Now remember, the words that are 30 to 50 are like extra credit type words. And then the 50 or more, you have to learn them. All right? And so you have pages 6 to 19 say, boy, this is a lot of words. But a lot of these words you don't have to learn because they're less than 50 times. So if you go to page 6, um, well, let me, let's quickly review that. Let me just go review a qu few things quickly in the introduction, and then I'll have you say the words after me. So basically, if you look on the table of contents, he has the types of words divided by categories, animals, the body, family, food, and drink. It's a nice way to divide them up and a helpful way to kind of learn those groups of words together. And on page one in the introduction, which we're not just going to read the whole introduction, but he says this is a vocabulary building resource for all learners, whether autodictats or participants in a classroom. An autodictat is a self-taught person. So why say you're self-taught? You say you're an autodidact, right? So that's what that means if you don't know. He says that the best of his knowledge, no work like this one for Koine Greek exists, and this is very nice. Modern Greek, of course, has picture books. But this is very nice work for Koine Greek. So there's 800 words and images here to help you gain competency in Koine Greek vocabulary. Most of the words are nouns, and they're chosen because you can illustrate them easily, which is reasonable. Okay. Uh, if you're stumped by an image, he actually doesn't put the English meaning for the word underneath the word, and that's because he wants you to be thinking in Greek. All right. He wants you to think the image instead of thinking the English word. If you're not sure what it means, you can always look in the back, and in the back he tells you what they are in English. So that's fine. But he does want you to try to, I'm not quite as hardcore as him about not learning the word in English, just like learning the image. I think it's fine if you learn it in English, OK? But uh, just so you know, that's why there's no English words, just the picture and then the Greek word. You have 10 sections in the book, 10 different semantic domains. and. He says this helps you make connections. So for example, here on the picture, you have arneon, the word lamb, and then thusia, sacrifice, you have the lamb on the altar, and probaton, uh, you know, you have, uh, so it, it's um, uh, sheep. You can kind of see there's a connection between the words, and it kind of helps you jar your memory. So. And uh, it's been, apparently when images and sounds, and the, the more senses you use in vocabulary acquisition, the better. You kind of learn more together. So that's helpful. So these printed images help. Uh, he says he tries to uh, bypass English as much as possible. We talked about that. So you connect the picture with the word and try to think in Greek. And it is good when you learn these vocabulary words or all your vocabulary words, say them out loud. Use as many senses as you can here. I mean, don't lick the book, okay? But yeah, you know what you're eating? You're eating lamb, arnion, agathos. I wouldn't know what that's like. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. Then don't eat <laughs> for, for a vegetable. You're eating corn. All right. Grill lamb. To see a sacrifice. <laughs> Grill lamb. All right. He says some of the images with the book could be uh, anachronistic, maybe a little bit. Like he has a, a modern theater for theatre on. No, whatever. It's. Um, it's true that maybe the image is a little anachronistic, but he's still trying to help you connect it in your mind. Okay. Now, he mentions that sometimes Greek words have more than one meaning, but there's only going to be one visual. I mean, that's just kind of obvious. You can't you know, illustrate many different meanings. So, and he says on page three, try to use the back of the book as little as possible because he wants you to associate the image in your mind. So that's the introduction. I like this book. It's very helpful. Supplements the vocabulary. Mounts gives you so little vocabulary. And some of the vocabulary here will overlap with mounts. So again, 30 to 50 times extra credit type words. And then the other ones, uh, 50 or more, please learn them. And the other, if you want to learn them, great. But you don't have to. But uh, you know, this can even help you in your con these are These are images you might see in daily life as you're trying to speak Greek as you're going around your house and going around town. Use these words when you see them. 
So I'll say the words, and then we will um, say them together. And I'll say what they mean in English, too, despite he might be horrified that I would do that. So the top there of page six, Zoa, Zoa, living creature, animal. Zoan, Zoa, living creature, animal. And I'm not going to tell you whether it's an extra credit word or normal word. It's 39 times, so it's an extra credit, okay? Probaton, probatu, ta, sheep. Probaton, probatu, ta, sheep. Arnion, arniu, ta, lamb. Arnion, arniu, ta, lamb. Then we skip uh, thusia. Ichthus, ichthuos, ha, fish. Ichthus, ichthuos, ha, fish. No, do you have a pen I can use for a second? I've got to fix my notes. I put down that was a sheep. Just copying and pasting from before. That is not a sheep. <laughs> That's a fish. You've got to fix that. got to fix that on my notes. If I, cut and, I don't want to cut and paste that into a test and say that ichthus is a sheep. And you know, that's like the symbol, you know that, that, that Christian symbol, the ichthus thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, since we're Jesus Christos, uh, I can't remember what the rest of it is. The, theos kai soter, or something like that. Oh, theos huiu. Theos huiu, son of God and Savior, yeah. Jesus Christ, son of God and Savior. So ichthus. Ichthus, ichthuasa. Of course, that's not ordained specifically of God in the New Testament. So fish, um, they're the ichthus, ichthuas, huh? Hippos, hippu, ha, horse. Hippos, hippu, ha, horse. Office, opheos, ha, Dra um, serpent. Office, opheos, ha, serpent. Petenon, petenu, ta, bird. Petenon, petenu, ta, bird. Here, this image is questionable its accuracy. Dracon, dracontos ha, dragon or serpent. Dracon, dracontos ha, dragon, serpent. So the lizard here, maybe you want to draw a dragon in there, something like that. Yeah, make it at least a red lizard. So yeah, dragon or serpent in the New Testament. Alector, electoros ha, rooster. Alector, electoros ha. Rooster. I think sometimes with that, with that word, I think about like Luther was printed by the Elector of Saxony, but it wasn't the rooster, it was you know, the German prince. But Elector means rooster. Right. Oh, by the way, notice on the top page seven, he gives you the title of the book in Greek too. Octakasioi logoi kai ekontes. 800 words and images. And now, they're going down in frequency, so we're skipping, actually, like all these words here on page 7. They're used less than 30 times, so you get to skip, skip, skip. Those are fun words. And we skip down. Do either of you have a dog? A kuon? Hey, kuon, kuon, kunas ha, hey ha. So there's the kuon. Those are birds. It's a flock of birds. All right. There's a little dog, Kunarion Hata. Oh. Okay. All right. So there's Jonah and the Katos, a whale. <laughs> little chicks. All right. All right. Down to the body. That's a word we have to know. Soma, somatos ta, body. Soma, somatos ta, body. I wish they'd had a little more clothes on, but then what can you do? Um, oh, I didn't put care down. Care, keros he, hand. Care, keros he, hand. Cardia, cardias he, heart. Cardia, cardias he, heart. Sarks. Sarkos he, flesh. Sarks, sarkos he, flesh. Phone, phones he, sound. Phone, phones he, sound. 
Necros are uh, on dead. Necros are uh, on dead. Ophthalmos, ophthalmuha, I. Ophthalmos, ophthalmuha, I. Hyma, hymatos ta, blood. Hyma, hymatos ta, blood. Pus pados ha, foot. Pus pados ha, foot. Stama, stomatos ta, mouth. Stama, stomatos ta, mouth. Prosopon, proso, prosopu ta, face. Prosopon, prosopu ha, ta, face. Kefale, kefales he, head. Kefale, kefales he, head. Dexios are uh, on. Right. Dexios are uh, on right. In other words, right as opposed to left, not right as opposed to wrong. Glosa, gloses te, tongue. Glosa, gloses he, tongue. Us, otas ta, ear. Us, otas ta, ear. And the rest of them are less than 30. All right. Okay, so let's stand up. Oh, and here we have ace two sionas ton ionon, which means ace two sionas ton ionon, forever and ever. Oxios or good Agathos. Oxios e curie la doxon. Kai ten temen, kai ten dunamen, hati su ectesos, ta panta, idea, ta thelema su, eisi kai ectes de son, axion estetarneon, ta Fogmen on lobbing, Tain do not min kai pluton, kai sophion, kai eskun, kai timing, kai doxon, kai eulogion, ace to sion, aston I own on. Saint Corinthians thirteen fourteen. He caris tu kriu yesu christu, kai he agape tu theu, kai he koinonia tu hagiu numatas metapontum mon. Amen.